Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, um, uh, for joining us today. Um, the, the usual running time for this is about two and a half hours, so we've got loads of time for questions. Um, we, can, we can take our time, we can speed up. Um, depends on, on what you want to do. Obviously, there's so many people here today. Different people will be at different levels of experience with MongoDB and, and performance as well. So we're, we're going to try to pace it um, kind of somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle, hopefully. Um, so we'll briefly introduce ourselves. My, my name is Ger Hartnett. I'm the performance lead. I'm based out of Ireland. Um, we've got a number of performance engineers uh, working on MongoDB all over the world from Barcelona, London, Dublin, uh, New York, Canada, uh, Seattle, and um, possibly other places on the West Coast soon as well, hopefully. Xiao Chen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao Chen. I'm a performance product manager uh, for MongoDB. And I just joined two months ago. I'm still new to MongoDB. And before this, I work for a relational database company. And if I say something wrong, which is MongoDB inappropriate, please forgive me. I'm still <laughs> adapting to MongoDB. And welcome to the session. And I'm glad all of you made it to the last day. We'll have fun today, and as Jerry said, we have a lot of time. We're going to have a lunch break, so you can grab lunch, and uh, we can have like a free talk maybe for half a, one hour, and then we can resume and have the second part of the, the talk. Yeah, I forgot to mention, I've been with MongoDB for coming up on nine years now, so it's like nine weeks, nine years. Yeah. We've got both <laughs> perspectives in the room. We've got you covered, beginners and ex experts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it would be great to know a little bit about you. Um, we have a lot of people here today. So could, could I ask for a quick show of hands? How many of you are developers? OK. How many are administrators, either database systems, SREs? A good number as well. How many architects or, or managers? Did anyone not put a hand up? Yeah? Oh, Shamik, product manager. Yeah, I forgot the product ask, manager. You didn't have the product manager. Yeah. <laughs> we have product managers in the Oh, room. and yeah, product as well. OK. I was talking to someone yesterday from our legal team, and she was thinking of coming, so I wanted to, I wanted to include everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad legal aren't here. But I think we are recording it, so we, we've got to be careful. Um, OK, so our goal today um, We've got a number of slides, and we can have breakout conversations as well. Um, but first, a, a little bit of an introductory story. Does everyone remember where they were in uh, March 2020? Yeah? OK. So it was a Friday night in late, late March 2020. Um, everyone was under pressure. We were all working from home. Um, our support team uh, got a frantic call late on, on that Friday night uh, from, from a startup company based in Northern Europe, um, a pretty early stage startup. And their software application in the education space was about to be featured on their national television station on Saturday night as a way for all of the children in their country to start learning remotely. So, you know, it was the whole COVID thing was a, they were feeling a mix of emotions, right? They were elated, and they were also really scared. Because um, you know, no one knew in the world what was going to happen at the time. They were running on Atlas. They didn't have a large data set already, which, which was good. So we were able to quickly help them convert their three-node replica set into a sharded cluster and to handle the deluge of users that were coming in the next day. So, Success ultimately can put your team under pressure, and you and your team under pressure as well. So you might have a minimal viable product. Um, it's taken off, and maybe the servers are getting expensive. And you need to you know, improve performance so the costs don't go up as fast as you add users. So you're scaling your minimal viable product into a humongously scalable one instead, hopefully. So this journey can be perilous. If you get it wrong, you'll be under constant pressure, and it can slow the growth of your business. I mean, we as developers, administrators, product managers, um, 
managers of all kinds, we, we don't want to be the ones that are the limiting factor in a business, um, whether it's large or small. And then when you have a large data set, making changes takes even longer again. Um, you know, the, the time windows you have um, to, to make changes, the maintenance windows start to get shorter as you have more people around the globe using your product. And then you end up, you know, doing, uh, doing these activities at weekends um, at inhospitable times for, for your engineers. Um, just so you don't disrupt users. So the solution to this, we hope, is 12 and counting uh, tried and trusted patterns for application and database performance tuning. Um, so that's, that's what we're hoping to cover today. So here's a, a high-level agenda. Um, so first we'll talk about the big picture. Um, we'll talk about performance requirements, um, systems thinking, um, how to identify bottlenecks and the overall diagnostic process. Did, did anyone go to the talk that Asia and Joanna did yesterday about uh, being a detective for cloud platforms? Anyone? A few people went to it. So, you know, it's, it's a similar type of process to the one they talked about yesterday. We'll, we'll probably go into a little more detail on that. Um, and next we'll dig into document schemas, queries, and indexes. Um, you know, if you've got experience with MongoDB, this, this, this will be an area you know uh, we'll be able to go a little bit deeper. I've got some resources we can point you to as well to go even deeper again. Then we'll talk about some specific strategies for scaling applications, and in particular, for the most part here, we'll be focusing on sharding. Um, but there's a few other patterns uh, for, for scaling as well that you can use. And then finally, we'll provide a summary and a list of, of related material uh, you can learn to use more about performance tuning. So please feel free to ask questions at any stage. We want to try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, you, know, you, you might not feel like talking about the details of some performance channel, challenge you're working on at the moment, but if you do feel comfortable about that and if you can summarize it in a way that you know, e everyone can understand fairly quickly, f feel free to bring that up. So, so we'd like to make it as interactive and as, as engaging for you as possible. As Zhao Chen said, after the first hour, we'll take a break for lunch um, we we'll tried to break slightly earlier in case you need to make any calls or check emails. Uh, I know I missed lunch for the last two days in a row, so I'm, I'm, I'm determined to try and catch lunch today. I'm sure you're the same as well. And then after that, we'll take a 10-minute break roughly every hour. Um, you know, so and we'll have time then, I think, at the end for, you know, smaller group discussions um, if, if, you, if you want to talk to us or if, or if we find that there's kind of some common theme, we can, we can discuss them towards, towards the end. Um, and then catch us afterwards if you don't feel comfortable talking in a bigger group. So that's the rough agenda. Any questions? I thought I saw a hand up, but it was somebody taking a photo. Cool. I think the slides are actually going to be posted somewhere on the web. Uh, PDFs of the slides. Um, and uh, I'll give you my email address afterwards, so if you can't get them in the next few days, you can, you can, uh, you can get back to me. Okay, so first we'll look at the big picture. Um, so we'll talk about performance requirements, thinking in systems, hunting bottlenecks. So I'm just going to give you a list of the patterns that we're going to go through. Um, so some of this part is going to be going back to first principles in a way. Um, and it may seem simple to some of you, or it might be material you covered back when you were in university, but it's sometimes good to kind of like go back and remind yourselves of the, 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 the basic first principles involved in, in optimizing systems. It'll also give us a bit of a shared context or vocabulary uh, today, so we're kind of, everyone's kind of coming from a different background, so it, it'll, it'll help set uh, a shared vocabulary. Then we'll go through patterns for queries, indexes, how to design schemas, the ESR rule, equality, sort, and range. And we look at bulk writes as well and why they can be very important if you've got a write intensive uh, workload or application. So we've got four patterns in this section. 
uh, designing the index, indexes, indexing sparingly, the ESR, as I mentioned, and, and bulk writes. Then we look at scaling systems, uh, starting with connection management, um, planning for scaling, how to select a shard key, balancing shards, and then finally the pre-production checklist as well. So that's the list of 12 uh, patterns. And then we've got one kind of extra one as well that's non, not MongoDB specific, which we'll get to if we have time. So first we'll, we'll talk about what patterns are. Um, so so it's, it's quite simple. It's, it's, it's a way to document a best practice in a particular field. And, and patterns didn't come from computer science originally. So there was, there was an architect, a real kind of building architect, uh, not a software architect, um, who came up with a formalism, um, a guy called Christopher Alexander. Uh, I think he was based in Berkeley University at the time. Um, so he came up with this, and he applied it at many scales, from the design of a single room uh, to the, you know, to the to a whole building, and then the whole urban design around the building as well. I was just up in the office this morning, and uh, Christopher, a, a customer sent a gift voucher there a while ago, and Christopher Alexander wrote a set of new books. The first one is called The Nature of Order. So this is kind of like the, so I was really excited to get this. So, you know, I ordered it on Amazon and picked it up at the office. So um, really looking forward to reading that in the plane on the way back. So Christopher Alexander's stuff, is, it's really interesting. It's about buildings at the start, but it kind of, it, it, it relates to more than just that. And then in the 1990s, uh, a couple of software engineers, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham, um, started to apply the pattern idea themselves. They, they, they were uh, two of the engineers behind extreme programming, um, which had four, you know, 12 disciplines of, of software engineering ultimately as, as well. And then it was further applied in this, this book. I don't know if some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, it's often called the Gang of Four book. Um, and, and that was uh, applied then to, to software design. Um, so so I, I guess a, another quick show of hands. Uh, are, are you using patterns at the moment? Have you used patterns? Quite a good, yeah. So maybe 20% of people. So. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of what patterns are for, for those of you who didn't uh, raise your hand. So in, in the kind of the formalism we're going to use, it's very close to the Alexander formalism. There's, there's all different headings that, that you can use. The Gang of Four book has got like, I don't know, about eight or nine headings for each of the patterns. Um, but we'll, we'll use the simple form today. So each, um, each pattern has, oh, each pattern has, has four sections, basically. There's the context, the problem, the forces, and then the solution. So we'll, we'll go through it with an example. Um, chocolate chip cookies. So when we were preparing for this, um, I was trying to organize chop, chocolate chip cookies, but it turns out it's uh, surprisingly difficult to do that. Um, and then I was going to buy some in the store and bring them in, but they said, no, you, you can't do that either. So uh, we'll have to imagine chocolate chip cookies and maybe get some, get some later. So, so we'll use it as, as our example. Sorry if I'm making you hungry now and you, you hadn't a chance to get something after, after the tea break, after the keynote. Um, so the first uh, section of, of each pattern is the context. So this is the, the kind of the situation we're in, maybe some of the constraints we have um, as, as we're trying to solve a problem, essentially. Um, and, and then when it comes to chocolate chip cookies, you know, it's, it's quite simple. We're, we're baking cookies at home. We're not baking cookies on an industrial scale, right? We're at home. That's the context. We're just going to bake a small batch of cookies. So that's, uh, that's, that's the context part. And then for the problem, we want to find an optimum ratio for, for the chocolate in the cookies to the cookie dough itself. And then the forces are kind of the contradictory considerations that we need to make. Um, so these are factors that we're trying to balance, basically, as we're solving a problem. And in the cookies case, you know, people tend to like the taste of the chocolate piece the best. But on the other hand, if you've got too much chocolate, you get an unstable cookie, right? It just kind of 
falls apart uh, when it comes out of the oven. So these are the two forces we're trying to balance when we're making chocolate chip cookies. So what's the solution? So typically, as we apply a pattern, there can be more than one solution. Um, and the solution ultimately tries to balance the forces. So in our example here, I've done extensive uh, research on the internet, and apparently the ideal ratio of chocolate to flour is 1.1 to 1. So I guess we're in the US here, so that's, I'll give the European measurements first because that's when on my speaker notes, I always get these numbers wrong. So if you've got 450 grams of flour, you'd have 500 grams of chocolate. Um, or if you had 16 ounces of flour, you'd have about 17 and a half ounces of chocolate. And I don't know how to convert that into cups or you know, whatever the, the, the other cooking measurements are here. So that's, that's the solution to our problem. So enough about chocolate. Uh, we'll move on to software and uh, databases again. And we'll start with uh, the first section or the first pattern, which is, um, which is understanding the requirements. So that's kind of common at the start of any project, really. We want to understand the requirements and our ultimate goal. Um, so the context here is you're starting work on building an application. Hopefully, you're not thinking about performance in the middle or just before you deploy into production. Now, I know nobody here in the room. I know you're all really smart people, and you'd never do that and leave performance to the last minute. But you might have friends in other companies, uh, so maybe you can you know, talk them out of, out of making that mistake. Um, so you, know, you could be in the middle of the project as well. It's time to start thinking about tuning performance. Um, and, and I guess the problem here is it can become a never-ending task. There's, there's always room for improvement. There's always an extra, you know, five, an extra 300 ops per second, operations per second to be squeezed out of, out of your application. Um, but it tends to be a law of mini, diminishing returns. You put more and more effort in, it's harder to, to get the extra improvements. Um, so it could go on forever. So what we're trying to balance here is a number of forces. Um, you know, the targets can be hard to define, and they're sometimes interrelated. Um, you know, the classic example is throughput and latency, um, you know, our, our read and write performance. Um, we had a question yesterday about, um, in, in, the, uh, in the Ask Me Anything panel, about, you know, making that trade-off between read and write performance and what you do when, when you want both. Um, so so that's, the targets can be related uh, and hard to define, basically. And then they can start becoming a, a moving target as well. Um, you know, the market changes, the requirements change, you add new features, um, and that affects performance. That, that's something that, you know, we've, our team focuses on quite a lot at MongoDB. Um, you know, we're adding new features to the core database server all the time. Um, those add extra lines of code, um, sometimes on the critical path. Um, there's it, unintended, unanticipated interactions between multiple components of the software um, that can slow things down as well. So, so we spend a lot of time watching out for potential regressions and trying to detect them. And, uh, and you know, trying to mitigate them in different ways. I can go into that. We don't go into that in a lot of detail here, but if anyone's interested in, in how we do performance engineering of the database itself, you know, we'd be glad to talk um, separately um, later. Um, so it's, uh, we've built quite a sophisticated system now to try to make sure regressions don't get into the field. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's impossible to test everything, right? As I'm sure you know. Okay, so let's get back to requirements, the, the start of the project. Um, so first, we need to get agreement from the stakeholders as early as possible. Um, and uh, it, sometimes in, in uh, performance management, the other kind of performance when you're managing people, they talk about the, the SMART kind of acronym, and that, that kind of applies here as well for, for software systems. So it's good to have very specific requirements. Um, it's good to make sure that they're measurable in some way. Um, you want to make sure that they're achievable. It must be realistic for the hardware that you're going to deploy your software on. 
Um, they should be relevant to the end users. And, and finally, they should be time bound. That is something that's achievable um, in the time frame that you have. And ultimately, you're going to have more data. Um, that's, I guess, one of the challenges. I, I missed the earlier talk. I'm, I'm presuming um, Ray Kurzweil was talking about you know, entropy in the universe and the ever-increasing amount of content and photographs we're storing on the web and nothing ever being deleted anymore. Was, was that part of it? I really should have checked in to see. Was that? OK. So the data is ever increasing. And uh, sometimes it takes time to delete it as well. So you, you, sometimes you need to build that into, into, your, um, into your software plans. I just realized my, my laptop isn't plugged in. That would have been funny. Um, so let's look at some good and bad examples. So is this a smart performance requirement? Make it as fast as possible. Have you, have you heard that before? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's not smart. Um, we, it could go on forever, basically. Uh, it's not very measurable either, really, is it? Um, a million queries per second on a one gigahertz CPU. Okay, so that's 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 probably something like like a, a base station kind of class CPU that costs eleven dollars or something like that. So it's not going to do a million queries per second. Let's see what's the next one. Ten k user updates per second. Twenty five k. DB writes per second on an M60 with 5K IOPS. Is that one smart, specific? Is it realistic? OK, hopefully that's a good example. OK, so that's getting the requirements right. Am I going, uh, we'll, we'll have a little uh, opportunity for feedback. I've, I've got a kind of a form a Google form that you'll be able to fill out at the break and, and give us some feedback on, on pace and things like that. This, this section is going to be a little bit slow to start off with and then, and then speed up. But is everyone OK with the pace so far? Do I need to go a bit faster, slower? Does anyone have any questions about this section? Cool. OK, we'll get on to systems then. Pattern number two. What was there a picture there? Yeah, the Pompidou Center. Anyone seen this in France? It's really cool, all the, all the plumbing is on the outside. It was designed by an Irish guy, actually. Um, so now we have performance requirements. Now we want to understand the system that we're trying to tune. And ultimately, any system is a, an interconnected set of elements organized in some way for some purpose. You know, that's the kind of the, the dictionary definition. So in our case, we're working with software components. There's a number of different elements. Um, we'll start to look at the elements of a typical software application with a database in the next section, but we'll talk about general systems at the moment. So there's a couple of good examples. Um, it's really hard to find stock photography of the solar system on the internet, so no one's really taken a photograph of it yet. So there's, here's a photograph of a model of it instead. So we've got the solar system, right? Uh, so that's our home in the universe. Then on this planet, we've got uh, you know, the climate systems and weather. Those are systems as well. Um, we've got nested systems, like a university. Um, it contains faculties, professors, students, different courses. We have forests. We have the trees in the forest. That's a system as well. The animals in the forest, they're a system. The cells within the animals in the forest are a system. So these are all interconnected, independent elements that are communicating. And ultimately, that's the, the way our software is organized, too. So the problem is that here with systems is they sometimes behave in surprising ways, especially when we try to change them. And, and our human minds are, are, are not very good at understanding systems. Um, and, and here's one that, that we saw a lot of earlier, so uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I'm just going to use it as an example to show one way of modeling a system at a high level. So there's inputs to a system, like the total population on the bottom left corner. 
There's, there's stocks, so there's things in the system. There's variables which affect the flows, like contact frequency uh, of people. And then there's feedback loops, and the feedback loops can be either reinforcing or balancing feedback loops as well. So this is one way to kind of like model a system. And in general, we, we really start to struggle when there's nonlinear um, kind of progressions in numbers. Um, we, we, we don't kind of, uh, we don't process that very well. We tend to see behavior as a, of a system as discrete events that are happening and not, not see the patterns. We sometimes miss the patterns uh, of, of, of that behavior in those discrete events. So we'll go through a little bit of an example here. Um, another one that came up in the last few years. So you've got a stock, which is toilet paper inventory in a store. Uh, this is what we saw at one stage in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, empty shelves in, in that section. Um, you've got customer demand. Um, you've got the store manager. Um, so there's, there's a ramp in customer demand, basically. The store manager is trying to tweak the system uh, to make sure that there's, there's enough stock for, for all the customers. And then there's deliveries from the factory. So there's a, there's a number of factors involved in, in this relatively simple system. But as we can see, um, so let's imagine demand goes up on day 10. You know, this, she's trying to keep um, 10 days of demand in inventory. So that's, that's her general plan for, for managing stock in the store. And the demand has been consistent all the time and then something surprising happens and there's a 10% or maybe more increase in demand on day 10. Now, if there's no delays in this system, no problem. She just increases the order and you know, all the extra inventory arrives the following day and uh, th th there's no problem. But unfortunately, the real world has delays. So th there's a, f a few delays inherent. Uh, so there's a perception delay. So she doesn't want to kind of react too quickly. So before placing an order, she's going to look at the last five days and average sales over, over that five days. So that's, that's the first delay built into the system. And then she's, she's going to make up the shortfall. So she's going to see what's her target inventory and how far am I behind it. And I'm going to, I'm going to order 40% of the inventory to, to close, the, close the gap in, in the inventory that I want. And then there's going to be a delivery delay as well. So it's going to take five days for the, the toilet paper to arrive at the store. So how do you think this is, this is going to look if I was to graph it? Plug all this into a spreadsheet and draw a graph. It doesn't look too good. So it, you know, for those of you who did control engineering in college, you know, this, this thing basically starts to oscillate out of control. Um, so it, it, you, know, it, it, you can see increasing oscillations over time. I think by day 60, we're up to is it 3,000? Yeah, so way over stock at that stage. You know, the store is full of toilet paper at that, that stage. And uh, there's, there's nervously little on day 50. So this is what happens to systems. And, and this is a relatively simple one. But don't panic. We can make changes. So there's, there's, as we said, there's a couple of different delay types built in here. So we can change. The perception delay, how many days she waits to average before ordering. We can change the response delay, how quickly she tries to make up the shortfall. We can't change the delivery delay. We, you know, that, that stuff is always go, just going to take five days. That's, that's, that's the way it works. So we can't change that one. Anyone got any suggestions for, for what we should try to change? Come on, don't be shy. Perception today? So, reduce perception today? Yeah, because that shit's short for Okay. Somebody say something over here? Try to model it. Try to model it? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples now in a minute, but what would you try change first? So we have the perception delay was, was suggested over here. What, what else would you change? The response. Make a increase. So, so try to make up more of the shortfall. Yeah, so don't panic. Try to hold it, the decision. Okay. Okay. So spread the adjustment over over less days. Try to make up the gap faster. Anyone got any other suggestions? Hey, I have a, I have a, I have a scream. I have a loud voice. Um, yeah, you can, I mean, shrinking the delivery time is something that's all in the news in the past. I don't know, however many months. Yeah, it is. That's it's topical, but. It's not an option here. This, that would make it too many variables. So. I mean, like, you, like conceptually, if you have like multiple factories that are dependent on each other, you probably want them in the same near near each other or near the resources. It's so like yeah. build your toilet paper factory near the forest. I don't know. Have a second supplier. You know, it's like having two cloud platforms and yeah. you know using a single technology then to manage your data across all of them. Yeah. It seems like the perception delay. It seems like in this model, the perception is you're using a single perception model for all inventory in the store, so it doesn't seem to be taking into account context and the uh, predictive aspect of what's going on around the environment. Yeah, so to, to adapt it for different types of in inventory, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. That's making it more complicated again. Let, let's see how it behaves when it's, when it's this simple. Anyone got any other suggestions for how to change it? So we've got shorten the perception, try to respond faster. Anything else? OK. So let's see. We've got those options. We'll, we'll, we'll look at th a third one as well. Let's try a slower res response, too. So we can't touch the delivery delay, as I said. So here's faster perception. Still oscillates out of control. So. You see the green line actually goes, I can flick over and back between. This is the normal delay that we started out with, where she's making up 40% of the shortfall. So you can see it really just pulls the oscillations back in a little bit earlier. And, and the oscillations actually get a little bit worse as well. So I think with, with, with the standard delay that we started with, um, you know, it's going up to close to 3,000. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's now the, the, the oscillations are going up slightly higher. So if anything, it made things worse. It made the oscillations a little bit higher, and it just pulled everything back a little bit. So that didn't really help, just flicking over and back there. It's a poor man's animation. OK, so that didn't help. Let's see what happens if we try to make up the shortfall faster. OK. That's, that's not good either. Um, so the oscillations are even worse. At least they stopped getting worse. I mean, they went up to 4,000, but they're, they're kind of peaking at the top end and the bottom end. Um, but the oscillations get much worse. So let's try and actually reduce the, percep the, per the, percep the slower response. So, so in this case, we increased it to try and make up 60% of the shortfall. And now we're going to only try to make up 25% of the shortfall. So we're not going to try and catch up as quickly. And it kind of wobbles around the desired inventory line and eventually starts to stabilize. So the oscillations dampen. The peak reduces. We're only at the most. We only ever get up to 2,300 units of of toilet paper. So, so doing the opposite of the thing we think we should change actually made the system better. And one of them, we've got, you know, it made it fairly catastrophic. Um, That's what happened in the market. Yes. Yeah. The flash crashes and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the thing. The, these, these systems, there's multiple interacting elements. There aren't always rational actors. Um, you know, and, and it can just get out of control really quickly. So in, in actual fact, she was re reacting too quickly, or she was reacting too, I guess, strongly. 
um, to, to the changes. And this is just with adding delays into a system. And the, the, the changes can have you know, surprisingly large effects or surprisingly small effects as well. And, and real systems are much more complex. As one of the speakers, the commenters mentioned, you, know, you could have multiple stocks. Um, you know, anywhere you have a feedback loop, there's a potential for oscillation, basically. And, and human beings are not good at understanding nonlinear growths. And it's not always clear either what the limiting factor in any system is. And, and we'll look at that in a minute uh, with, with uh, software systems and, and MongoDB systems in general. So what's the solution to this systems problem? Um, there's, there's a discipline called uh, systems thinking. There's a, there's a really good book written by a, a lady who's passed away now, unfortunately, Donella Meadows. Um, so it's a really good overview uh, of the discipline. I, I highly recommend it. Um, and, and there's some other reference material I can re recommend in this area as well. Um, we got lots of references later, and we put them up on Twitter with a QR code, so you, you just need to take a photograph of the QR code. Um, but this is ultimately about seeing the structures that underlie complex situations and then figuring out how best to change them without, without breaking things. So that's ultimately what we're trying to do at a high level. So the next pattern we go on to will be about hunting, hunting bottlenecks. Any questions on this before, before we move on? Again, it's some kind of base material, but it, it's, it's good to think about first principles. We'd start accelerating and going into, we'd, we'd start moving away from toilet paper now and start looking at IOPS and gigahertz and things like that. Any, any questions? OK, cool. OK, so now we're going to start hunting bottlenecks. Um, I don't know if that's New York or Las Vegas, actually. It looks like New York, is it? OK, so we look at performance tuning. So, so the context here is we're in the middle of the process of performance tuning. We haven't yet met the requirements that we saw in pattern one, so we haven't reached our target yet. And we're tuning a system that contains a number of elements. So we talked about elements in a system earlier. So, th so that's the context that we're in, basically. So many elements, and we haven't met our requirements yet. So as we mentioned earlier, it's, it can be hard to find the current bottleneck or the limiting factor of, of system performance. And then when you fix one of the bottlenecks, let's say you find one and it's disk IOPS and you fix that bottleneck, then performance will get better, but it's going to hit the next limiting factor. And that could be some other element of the system. It could be network bandwidth. It could be, you know, the, the CPU, the class of CPU of a particular component of the system. So the bottlenecks start to move around. So you've got to be prepared to kind of like, you know, aim, fire, shoot, and then re-aim at a different area and start tuning that. So it's, it's really a kind of a, a very iterative process. They move around. So we're going to look at a typical software system. This is at the highest level, and we'll, we'll start drilling down into more detail in each of these. So first, we have the user interface. Uh, and we've got your application code on the application servers. So this is typically the software that, that most of us think about. Um, and there's an API connecting those then as well. And then there's usually a network too. And sometimes the network can be unreliable. Next, we have some kind of framework that you might be using between your application code and, and, and the data platform underneath. So this, you know, this could be Spring if you're using Java. It could be Rails if you're using Ruby. Um, and these can generate some surprising queries um, for your data stores as well. Um, you know, they, they hide some of the complexity, which is great. Um, but you know, they, they can do surprising things as well. Anyone had a recent issue? Uh, actually, we could do a quick show of hands. Uh, who's using Rails, Ruby on Rails? Anyone? No? Java? J 
Java. And what kind of frameworks are you, are you using Spring? Yeah. Hmm? Spring and Drop OK. Anyone using Node? Um, uh, what, what, what frameworks are you using? Sorry, Mongoose? Yeah. Anyone using, was it Vercel were here the other day? Next.js? OK, um, C Sharp. What, what are the frameworks in C Sharp? OK. So often we see, like, at a database level, some surprising queries may be coming out of the framework. So these, these are definitely a factor. Um, so the next, next layer is the, the device drivers, usually supplied by, by your data, database vendor. Um, and they're, they're the, you know, running in your native language on your application servers, talking to the, to the data service itself. And hopefully the data services then are MongoDB or largely MongoDB, uh, not, not always completely, as, as, as we know. Um, so we're going to zoom in now on the, the data services piece and, and look at some more components there. Of course, we've got networks everywhere as well, connecting them all together. So now we're zooming in on, so the, 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 the top left, I don't have one of those pointer things where we, we were supposed to get a clicker, but um, we, something got lost in, in translation. So the, the, the bigger picture is after moving to the side and we're starting to zoom into the data services here. So there's a number of components, kind of logical components in your application that are running in, in the data services. There's the, the, there's the schema, uh, the, your database schema itself. Um, there's the queries that you're running. There's the indexes um, th that you might build. Um, you know, and those make frequent queries more efficient. But then there's multiple forces you need to balance here as well. So every time you add an index, it's going to impact your write performance and your insert performance in particular. And, and sometimes counterintuitively as well, if you've got a, a large amount of data that you're querying, if you're essentially doing uh, a query over a large amount of the working set, indexes can actually cause problems and make things worse um, because you're doing, you're doing extra IOPS. So it, indexes are not always the answer as well. So it's, a, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, you know, it, it, it basically, uh, it, you know, it, it uses the caches. There's multiple layers of caches in the system um, and, and it uses the caches and flushes things out of uh, that you might need in, 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 in memory. And then we have the database servers themselves um, you know, in, in the MongoDB case, there's, there's, there's shards and then there's multiple MongoDBs inside them. And then, it, you know, ultimately this has all got to be stored somewhere. Um, there's all different classes of storage. Um, to performance of storage is typically measured in IOPS. Um, a given cloud provider might guarantee a certain number of IOPS for a particular type of, of drive. Um, it might be, you know, 240 IOPS, for example, and then when you reach a threshold, any further accesses might be queued, resulting in disk bottlenecks, the latency start to get longer. The different cloud providers have different characteristics um, for, for what happens uh, in this case. Um, and then you could be using like NVMe drives, which can do like, you know, 1.5 million IOPS. Um, what a hard, hard drive at traditional spinning rust might only do 100, 150. So there's lots of different choices here as well. And then, you know, I guess we're, we're now looking inside the MongoDs on the bottom left corner. Um, and if you're using Atlas, you know, there's the black box, white box thing. Atlas is kind of like a dark gray, gray box to some extent. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's some, you've less variables to worry about, basically. Um, you, you pick your instance sizes, which determines the class of CPU or the amount of memory you get. And of course, there's the, you can configure the, the type of storage you want to attach to your Atlas clusters as well. So the good news with Atlas is it's a relatively simple picture. We try to hide the complexity um, that comes with drilling inside 
the, the, the box to some extent. So if you're running on-prem or in your own private cloud, it's a light gray box, right? There's, there's a, a few more components you need to think about. Uh, you've got the ne network connecting the, the servers again. Uh, that's one component. There's the replication subsystem. You might have you know, something affecting your secondaries that's slowing them down. Um, so that becomes something you need to worry about. If you're using Atlas, we worry about that for you. Um, there's the storage engine. You can configure the storage engine in different ways. Um, there's lots of settings uh, for, the, for the Wire Tiger storage engine that you can tweak. Um, you could be using different libraries um, with, with the database. You, could, you, know, you can choose different compression algorithms. Um, there's settings you can set for, for TC malloc, uh, the, the heap manager uh, that MongoDB uses. You can configure those as well. So the, the good news about the light gray box and running things on-prem is there's a lot more things you can tweak. Um, but as we saw, sometimes changing things can have unintended consequences and can, can make things worse. Um, there's the OS and the kernel. Um, you could tweak the I.O. scheduler, try a different I.O. scheduler. How, how many here are using Atlas and how many, how many are using Atlas first? So yeah, it's like half. So is everyone else on-prem? Yeah? The, the, the numbers didn't add up. Some of you, <laughs> some of you are running MongoDB on, on carrier pigeons, are you? On cloud, not on prem. Yeah, okay, but your own private cloud. Yeah. Yeah, AWS. So, have any of you like gone in and like tweaked things like sysctl and things like that? Anyone? Yeah. One or two. How, how did that work out? Really? Um, it it can be a bit of a. It's kind of scary, right? Um, things, things, you change things that should be better and they get drastically worse. Um, we, had, we had a customer about three or four years ago who really kind of started messing with that stuff and got, we got into a real cycle of complexity and ended up going back to the defaults again. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you can tweak if you're, if you're running, running it yourselves. You know, we, we try to kind of, tune things um, at a database, at, a, at, a, at a, an operating system level. Um, and it's something that we're continuously working on to, to try to tune things there as well for Atlas. Uh, but it's very difficult when there's so many different workloads that can be running on the servers. It's very hard to make uh, decisions that will work I in all situations. But we've got some ideas for how to, to make that better as well. But yeah, tuning the uh, I.O. scheduler or sysctl is, is interesting. Uh, virtual machine technology. Um, again, sometimes this gets counterintuitive as well. You know, allocating the right number of vCPUs if you're using VMware, configuring memory ballooning. Um, you know, that's, it's, it can be very powerful, but it, it, can, also, it can also lead to uh, very great difficulties. You can change things around the memory. You can, uh, you know, provide more memory to the wire tiger cache. You might want to provide less memory so the file system cache and the operating system has more space. So these are the things you can tune as well. Um, swap, transparent huge pages, NUMA, those kind of configurations. Then there's the instance sizes, uh, the number of cores. Uh, the type of instances, maybe you might try a different CPU architecture if, you're, if, you're, if you have that control over that. Um, and let me see where did that go? Yeah, storage. So you can start you know, playing with read aheads for the storage, um, you know, reconfiguring your controller caches. There's, there's all kinds of levels here. There's all, very many components that you could uh, tweak things in. So this, this is the full list, and it's a much bigger list, actually, in reality. Um, but these are kind of the, the 20 parts of the system that, that we've, uh, we've often found bottlenecks in. Um, so you know, I think you will have seen in, in many of the keynotes earlier one of the themes. You know, we're trying to make it so that you don't need to worry about everything on this list. 
Um, so if you're using Atlas, you only kind of need to worry about the, the ones on the first side. Um, you know, and there's uh, number one there is your UI and application code. We're, we're, we're trying to make it so that you don't have to worry about all of these details. Um, it, like when, when I first joined MongoDB, um, I, I had actually been working uh, for a startup and we were, we were actually trying to figure out how we were going to scale up the application if we were successful. Unfortunately, we weren't and we never needed to scale it up. Um, but one of the things we were looking at was, was MongoDB. And, um, and then I remember a couple of years later, I was going to visit a customer uh, in Sweden and they were about to like double the size of, the size of their sharded cluster from like 40 shards to 80. And uh, I was on the, you know, what I really liked was I, I was on the plane on the way over. Um, I had a sharded cluster running on my laptop. And you know, it's, it's not that much more complex to, to run queries against the sharded cluster. We, in generally, what we're trying to do is hide all of the complexity. Ultimately, these are distributed systems. They can get very complicated under the hood. And we're trying to hide that complexity for you. So that's kind of a multi-year journey that we're on. Um, and I, I know, you know some of the complexity leaks out every now and again. Uh, these are complex systems. But we're, we're, we're trying to, you'll see that theme of trying to, to make things simpler so there's less things you need to worry about. And, and the list on the left will start to get shorter, we hope. OK, so let's see. What's next? Oh yeah, a little bit more background in ter terms of theory. So when we look at it inside each element of the system as well, it typically has a queue of requests coming in. This is in your parts of the system. This is in MongoDB. This is in the components inside MongoDB as well. So typically, there's a queue coming in of work requests of some kind. And then you've got one or more service threads that are working on the requests. This is what's inside the network cards of your servers. This is actually what's inside the processors of your servers as well. Um, and if, if we squint hard enough, this is what MongoDB looks like inside as well. There's a, there's a number of these kinds of, you know, multiple threads of control, a queue, and, and, and those threads are handling the service requests. And then what happens is some of those threads, those service threads interact with shared resources as well. So for example, if you're running a query in a MongoDB server, one that's running in one thread could be consuming you know, storage engine cache that's slowing down all of the other um, operations that might be running at the same time. So you've got like a regular write workload going on and then you know, what, one of your DBAs, sorry to pick on, the, there was lots of DBAs over in this corner. One of your DBAs, this is, you know, this, this, it happens sometimes. I know none of you would do this, but, um, you know, you might have friends who might, you know, run a query on, you know, a full collection with no index on the production system and, you know, the, the alarms start to go off all over the place. And, and that's basically because it's using a shared resource that the other uh, uh, threads were trying to use. So the, the, some of the potential bottlenecks are in, interdependent. So for example, you know, you might have a single threaded workload uh, and if in your application code, and, and that's ultimately going to be limited by I/O latency, the network and 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 the storage latency on on the inside, and, and in that case, your application is the bottleneck, and there's unused capacity elsewhere in the system. So all your application servers are run, running at 100%, and the CPU CPU utilization and I/O utilization on the MongoDB database servers are like 5%. Um, so, you know, so, so basically then as you add more concurrency, as you add more threads, uh, the number of concurrent operations increases up to and beyond the number of CPUs. And then eventually, if you keep overloading that system, the throughput typically takes a down curve because it starts to, you know, the whole system starts to become less efficient. There's more context which is happening. Um, and that kind of threshold and how quickly you fall off a cliff on the other side of it, that, that, that depends on your application. So sometimes it's about determining the optimum number of 
concurrent active operations that, that, that can be running and really experimenting with that and measuring throughput and latency. And we'll cover this in more detail. This is the kind of the general problem. We'll cover this in more detail in the later section where we talk about connection pools. But as we mentioned, you can have a, the, the second uh, type of interdependent bottlenecks is when a certain query might use more memory. So for example, wildcard indexes in MongoDB, dollar near sorts, or deduplication. Uh, some of what we see in some examples is co customers will do a dollar in query with a huge number of things that they're trying to match. Um, so those can take up shared resources like memory. Um, you know, so you, you have that steady stream of, of updates c coming in and, and the analytics queries, you know, it, it starts pulling a lot of data in from disk, you know, pushing things out of cache. Um, and, and that's going to affect a steady state workload that you care about as well. Actually, you know, you can even have, I remember a recent customer situation where they had something that was downloading the log files um, and the log files were quite large because, because of a different problem. Um, and that was using memory bandwidth and I.O. bandwidth uh, on the disks as well. So it actually took quite a while to, to, to figure that one out. So these are the elements of the system. Ultimately, you know, the, I can't remember whose law it is. There's a, does anyone know whose? Little's law, is it? Anyone familiar with the maths of this? It's on, it's on Wikipedia. Little's law, I think, covers a lot of this stuff. Okay, so what are the forces here? So scaling can increase costs. Um, you know, if you add more CPUs, higher powered CPUs, or fast, faster storage, it'll cost more. Um, so, so that's one of the forces. And, and then there's short and long-term goals as well. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to hunt the bottlenecks and find them. So let's quickly look at, at, at some solutions. So, First, we want to gather some data. Um, does the working set fit in memory? The working set is basically the size and frequency, the, the size of frequently used data and indexes. Uh, and we'll see a deeper example of the working set later. But you know, you, first off, you want to kind of quantify this, figure out what the working, typical working set you have and if you've got enough memory. In, in general, um, you need to be aware of the costs of, of a particular operation. Um, we mentioned earlier, you know, a query that runs over a large data set. It's likely the data won't be in any of the many caches if, if it hasn't been frequently used. Um, there's multiple layers of caches in these systems. And worst case, the database will have to retrieve each document from a different disk loca location. So there's, there's extra IOPS. And, and the system will have some you know, IO bandwidth somewhere along the way, either from the disks to the database server or even in the network as well. And, and this is shared amongst all the queries that are running at the same time. So the solution here is to follow an iterative process. Um, so we'll go through that in, in the next slide, the iterative process, very similar to what Asia and Joanna talked about yesterday. Um, so at a high level, you want to you know, generate hypotheses, prioritize them, validate the top prior hypothesis, make one change, and observe how it affects things. You can also contact a support organization. They have lots of experience of, of tuning these kinds of systems. So, it's, so the, I'm just being mindful of time now. Uh, I think uh, lunch is coming soon. Um, so we'll quickly skip through this piece. So there's typically five steps to the diagnostic process. Um, first, you want to generate hypotheses, which would be possible explanations for the current bottleneck. You know, for a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We have, we have people in, in the team who, are, who know a lot more about storage, so they, they always, they always start with the storage devices, and some people know more about CPUs, and, and they start there. Typically, you want to generate many hypotheses at an early stage as possible. So it's good to keep, get a group of people together to brainstorm them. And the good news is if you've got lots of people, they'll have lots of different levels of experience, and they'll have experience in different areas of the system. But the bad news is everyone's got their own pet theory, right, uh, based on their experience. And, and then this, 
the conversations can get bogged down in one area and you know go off on a tangent or go way too deep into a particular solution. So we, what we try to do is we focus on generating quantity first, you know, throwing as many ideas for what could be the performance issue, you know, at the wall and see which ones stick. So we, we try to kind of avoid going too deep um, and, and kind of analyzing a particular hypothesis at the early stage. So yeah, focus on quantity first. So then we want to look at the multiple, hopefully we've generated four or five hypotheses for the performance problem. Oh, that, that cut out the sound, did it? Cool. Um, so you want to kind of try to then gather some evidence that might uh, support the hypothesis. And it's important to time box those discussions as well and not, not to spend too much time on them. And this is where you can link back to the requirements discussion as well. You know, oftentimes when I've been involved in these kinds of conversations, it's like, you know, sometimes you just got to ask, you know, what are we trying to do here? What is the end user kind of perceivable performance improvement we're going to hit? You know, if we're way down deep in, you know, wire tiger cache size, is this actually going to, you know, have a perceivable benefit to the, to the customer or the end user. So now hopefully you've got a number one hypothesis. You know, you kind of prioritize them. You picked from the five and, and you're down to one. So it's our prime suspect from the, from the kind of the, the, um, the, 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 the detective kind of analogy. Um, so we need to now try to identify a test that could prove or disprove the hypothesis. Um, so, you, you know, you could, make a simple change. Um, you know, usually we start off with, you know, are we CPU bound or IO bound? Um, and then try to increase the resources of one of them on the component that we su suspect to begin with, and then see if performance improves. If it doesn't, there's some other bottleneck, there's some other limiting factor uh, that, that's uh, restricting the performance of the system. Or you could increase the number of threads um, if you know that um, if you know that um, you know the the, the 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 bottleneck is a particular subsystem. And then, in terms of making changes, we would you know suggest making one change at a time, unless your production down. Um, it was an interesting situation with one of our customers a couple of years ago with. Um, in the financial services area, I won't name names, um, but you know we'd been working with them for a number of months, and I think we'd kind of made like five different performance improvement suggestions, and they were like, "Yeah, no, um, you know we, we we'll do that uh, when we have our next maintenance window," and they kept putting these things off, and then it was in the end of a quarter, and. They, they had a catastrophic issue. And um, they basically applied all five of their recommendations um, on that day. And everything was fine again. Um, but we don't know which one worked or you know, if it was a combination of the factors. Um, you know, so, so ideally, you want to make one change at a time. You know, it's good to learn and you know, know what was the thing that, that made the difference? What was the change that made the difference? But, you know, sometimes if you're production down, you, you don't want to take the time to do that. And then finally, you want to observe the effect, measure the improvement. And great, if we've met the requirement, um, we can celebrate, you know, go have a party. And if not, we need to go around the loop again uh, and, and work our way around um, the, the, the loop and basically incrementally get closer to the performance requirement that we've met earlier. The, the Atlas performance panel can be a big help there. There's, a, there's, a, there's lots of metrics and measurements that you can look at. There's almost too many. Um, but the, the performance panel is very useful for figuring out where, where the bottleneck in the, in the overall system is. Um, so you can see like the number of active operations, the type, the network traffic, memory consumption. You can see, you know, hot collections as well. But ultimately at a high level, you know, it's good to separate it out first into whether you're CPU or I.O. bound. Okay, so that's three of the first patterns, the introductory stuff. 
So I think this is probably a good time to take a break. Um, lunch should be here, I think, at, at 12, uh, 30. Um, it's an opportunity maybe to catch up on emails. What, one thing we're going to show this slide a few times, there's a, there's a web form here, and it's just a very, very simple two-question form. Um, and it's, it's anonymous, so it's not going to take your email address or anything. And basically, it's just asking, how happy are you on a range of zero to four? And um, how, you know, it, there's a free text uh, panel if you've got some suggestions um, or questions. And we'll, we'll, we'll request periodic feedback and we'll try to make some adjustments as we go along. So that's, we'll be coming back and looking at queries and indexes later. Um, and that should take you to a Google form. Has anyone tried it yet? Um, it works? Excellent. Okay, cool. I was trying it last night, but it was after a couple of beers, so I wasn't entirely sure. I, I missed the, the party. Was it good? Yeah? Okay. Some thumbs up. Hopefully you're not too tired. We had a gentle start so far. We'll start to accelerate as the day goes on. Is there any questions before we break up? Is there anything anyone would like to? Yes? So a lot of the time uh, when you're investigating these, a lot of the time when you're investigating these hypotheses, it ought to make sense to sort of paralyze the investigation. You might have someone grow off and yeah. come up with the test for this. Yeah. And so having done a lot of the work, um, even if you're the first thing you try meets your requirement, does it ever make sense to just go ahead and someone says, I think this can get us another yeah. 50%? Yeah, it, it, it does. And it, you, so, sometimes what we find is there's kind of, um, you know, there's, once you get so far and you've built up so much context, you, you know, the, there could be an extra 20% performance improvement for an extra 5% effort, you know. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's a really difficult thing in, in any project. You often have that kind of like nonlinear kind of effort to value kind of payoff. And, you know, it, it's a thing where you got to kind of practice with those kind of judgment calls. It, to be honest, it's something we struggle with all the time, you know, knowing whether by, you know, if we, if we go this little bit further, there could be a, a much bigger performance pr improvement here. Or maybe we're flogging a dead horse, right? And uh, you, know, you could put weeks more effort in and, and tweak, you know, improve things by 1%. So it, 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 I think it's a trial, trial and learning kind of thing for an, any organization. So guys, we will be resuming the, the, the talk approach like 1 p.m.? Yeah, 1 p.m. Yeah, like around yeah. 1 p.m. Sorry, so. we should have we should have said that. So, so is lunch being served out here? Or is it I think it's out there. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody can bring lunch in here. We don't know actually. But oh, really? I, 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 hopefully, it's out there. Yeah. Fingers crossed. So, well, yeah, we'll be back. We'll yeah. we'll restart at one. I'm going to turn. Testing one two. Hello. Hi. Okay, thanks everyone for coming back and thanks for all of the feedback on the um, QR code as well. So for the most part, um, thank you for, you know, I think we got some good high marks um, and some other things to work on. Thanks for the comments as well. We're gonna be going into more detail on, you know, working sets, um, sharded clusters, specific things. We're, we're not gonna be doing any live demos or anything like that, so some people had, had questions about that. Um, but if there's a particular performance challenge that you feel comfortable talking about, um, we, we can talk about those. There might be a bit of wisdom of the crowds. People in the room might have some experiences as well that, that could help. Um, so, so feel free to bring up anything like that. And for the person who said that they could hear, listen to me reading the phone book, thank you for the comment. Um, I really appreciated that one. I don't think my wife would agree with you, but anyway. Um, so anyway, we'll get, get on to um, queries and indexes. And as we said, we'll cover sharding and scaling and then putting it all together. So I'll cover this next section. Zhao Chen will cover the, the section after that and, and we'll have a wrap up as well. And there'll be another opportunity for feedback as well in the middle of this. 
So designing the schema, um, I was just talking to Daniel, who's one of the MongoDB engineers outside the door. He did a whole session on this at MongoDB World in 2020, I think. And there's a whole session, there's a whole workshop just about designing your schema. So this is gonna be a pretty high level introduction. We'll have pointers to other material um, that you can go deeper on. There's a lot of really good documentation in, uh, on uh, our documentation set as well about, about designing the schema. So in terms of patterns, um, you know, you could be at the early stage of a project, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a green field. You have a blank page, so to speak. Um, you're hitting writer's block. Um, and you have the opportunity to, to design your schema for the long term. So, you know, that's one context you could be in. You could also be later in the middle of the project. You could be in maintenance mode. New features are coming in, which means changing the schema. New queries are being added. Uh, and these change the query patterns as well. So. It, you know, MongoDB is a big part of what we're trying to do is make things more flexible and to increase the velocity and productivity of your, your teams, your technical teams. Um, but sometimes that flexibility means it's almost too easy to change things and people expect you to be able to change things much faster. Um, so so that, that becomes part of the challenge. Um, it's funny actually, one, what, one of our larger customers, I remember meeting them kind of in the early days and, and they were actually saying that it wasn't about the, the performance, the number of operations per second, per dollar, or per watt. Um, it, was, it was, they were able to turn around a new release in a week instead of three weeks. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't think of it like that before. But that, that was the kind of the performance that, that really mattered to them. Um, so anyway, change happens. Yes, MongoDB makes it easier to deal with change, but um, you know, sometimes that flexibility is a double-edged sword. So what's the problem we're trying to solve here? So, you know, because it's a flexible document schema, it doesn't mean you should ignore schema design completely. Um, you know, it's not really schema-less. There really are schemas internally. Um, and, and then as your data size grows and you maintain and extend your application, the existing queries can start to run slower as well. Has anyone had an experience of that where they've, they've had an application, it's been running for a while and, and there's kind of a degradation? Yeah? Can, can you tell us a little bit about the, that challenge? Sorry, I caught you at the ba a bad time. <laughs> yeah. So we, we definitely had an application, oh, sorry. We had an, we had an application at a previous company that I worked at where they started off with a small data set and they were running a daily query that had regex, and as their data size grew, that query performed a lot more poorly yeah. and resulted in production degradation that impacted the users. So we had to rewrite that query to get rid of the regex to fix the problems yeah. with their degradation. And, and was it a like was it a slow thing, and they slowly yes. realized it? It happened or was there, over time. Yeah, because I had to go back and compare what their data size looked like x amount of time before to yeah. now, and there was a massive size difference. Yeah. So while that that query ran perfectly fine months prior, as their data grow uh, grew that performance changed significantly. Yeah, and, and ultimately it's using a shared resource, either disk I.O. or some lock somewhere in the system. Um, and and you, know, you, you, you basically, you wanna stop it from using, overusing that resource and impacting everything else. Correct. Okay. Has anyone else had a, had a situation like that? I mean, you, you'll find, it, has anyone encountered like fragmentation issues? either memory or disk fragmentation. It used to be a much more of a problem before. I'm, I'm just curious in, in case anyone had, you know, ultimately, um, you know, things start to move around in disk. There's more holes in the disk. Um, you know, you can, you can start to get a buildup of, of performance issues over time. But it's, we've done, a, we've worked in successive versions to, to minimize the impact of that. In the past, you know, the kind of workaround was to, you know, 
uh, you know, take a member out of the replica, replica set, clear it, and then resync re re it again, um, which was, you know, kind of unpleasant at times, but uh, you know, it, it did work. So anyway, the schemas mean you can model data more naturally. Um, you know, the the documents basically map more easily to most of the modern object-oriented programming languages you have. So you can embed arrays, sub-documents, tables, even key values, key value pairs inside the documents. And, and as you know, you can you can modify the schema granularly, you know, gradually without migrations or downtime. And, and then it, it also simplifies the mapping of classes to documents stored in the database. You know, so it, it can kind of reduce the, you can have a lot less collections than you would have had tables in a, in a relational database. Um, you know, sometimes it can be a, like a factor of eight or 10 for, for, for some designs. Mark had a good diagram, I think, in the keynote the other day showing like an entity relationship diagram that was really quite complex. So thankfully, that, that, that simplifies a lot. And finally, th you have a number of options when it comes to the cost-benefit trade-off. Um, typically, increasing performance will increase your costs. And as we said earlier, we want to do that in a, a non, you know, in, in a, you know, in a, uh, in a way that's uh, sublinear, ideally. Uh, so we want we want to be able to increase the number of users by ten, but only increase your cost by five, ideally. Um, so those are the forces uh, when it comes to queries. So there's three main parts really to this uh, pattern solution. So first, a lot of the time what people start to think about uh, these problems from the schema point of view. And what we find, you know, when you start to approach the schema design is to almost flip that on its head and think about the queries instead. What uh, you know, what operations in your application from your UI to your application servers, what are the queries they're going to need to run on the database? So to almost flip it around and think from a more query-centric uh, point of view, it can actually lead to more efficient queries in the longer term. One of the key decisions to make is whether to embed sub-documents or store them in, in another collection. And in general, you know, if the document and its sub-document are read and written together, you embed them. Um, and we'll see some examples in the following slides. We'll go into more detail there. Um, and then finally, when you have your application up and running in production, or you're in pre-production testing, you know, it's good to review the data model do a memory sizing exercise, or, or you can look at the shape of the data using Compass. If if uh, if you've if you've tried Compass, it's it's really good for visualizing what the shape of your data looks like. So we'll start to look at an example schema. Um, so we've got the, uh, you know one of the standard examples. We've got we've got books. We're storing books uh, in the database. So it's, it's quite simple. We've got the ISBN numbers. These are not the real ISBN numbers. Um, and the title of the book and the author. So here's, here's, there are some of the books that, that uh, I've read recently that I liked. Um, so we've got the book documents. So now what we want to do is we want to decide how to add reviews into the schema. So the, you know, the simplest way to do that is to embed them directly uh, into an array inside each book. Um, so you can see here, we've got reviews coming in from different countries, different ratings, the date of the review, and the free text comment that, that somebody would have added as a, as a book review. So that's the, that's the embedding. Uh, when we refer to embedding, that's, that's what the, that looks like from a schema point of view. And then the, the, the way to do that with a reference is you've got, you could have a separate collection, or you could actually store the reviews in the same collection as well. So collections can have multiple types of documents in them. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to separate them out in, into multiple collections. So that's something that people sometimes assume they have to do, but you don't necessarily need to do that. So it could be a second collection, or you could just uh, add these documents into the same collection. And in, in this case, there's a reference. So you can see here, you, you see the ISBN number 
for the book that, that each review is for. You've got the country again, the rating, the date, and the comment. Um, and th this is preferred if you're not going to be reading or writing all of the reviews when reading or writing each book from the database. And, and the thing is, ultimately, the number of reviews is going to start scaling up, right? You know, so if it's like Harry Potter, you know, there's, there's going to be, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of reviews. So the array, the array could get really huge if you're embedding them, and you could hit the maximum document size limits. So you, you got to think about how these things are going to start scaling as, as, as the application gets bigger, you get more usage and, and more users. As I mentioned earlier, compass can be used to understand the shape. Um, and you can, it gives you, uh, you know, histograms to, to understand, understand the schema. Um, it looks at a, a sample of the documents in the database. So it's not gonna look at every document. It's not, it's not doing collection scans and querying everything. So it's giving you hopefully a repre representative sample. You can see different fields and their types and the most frequent values as well. Um, and then also for arrays, it'll show you the min, the max, and the average lengths of them too. So we might have like a, a restaurant application uh, for the five boroughs, and it'll tell you know you, you'd be able to see you know which which boroughs the the restaurants are in at, at a high high level, and uh, you know the average lengths of arrays and things like that. Of course, you know the the arrays could have strings; they could have different types in them too. And you can use Compass with either Atlas or, or your own uh, self-managed MongoDB system as well, whether it's on-prem or in your own private cloud. So that's great for kind of getting a sense of, of the data that's there. So memory sizing, we referred to this a little bit earlier. Um, so one way to, to, to do memory sizing is to, if you've got access to the shell, you can use the dbstats command. That'll give you the size of the indexes and the data set itself. And we've got some really good documentation um, you know, around this, around the different uh, sizes of the Atlas clusters and, and how to select the right tier. Um, so there's really good uh, guidance in that documentation about calculating the, the working set size. And then it, you, you want to um, you know, make sure that it, you know, the, the data set, you know, ultimately, you know, it, it's not, it, as things scale, it's not all gonna fit in memory. Um, but you wanna minimize the amount of disk accesses to, to reduce latency on the back end into MongoDB from the storage. Um, you could use faster storage. Um, and then, you know, it, ultimately, uh, you know, Google started probably with one server. They can't run Google anymore. Uh, so they've got to use multiple servers. So sharding, partitioning your data set comes into play here as well. Actually, is anyone using uh, Atlas auto, auto scaling? Any, anyone tried that yet? Yeah? How is it working? Yeah? Is it working well? Eating? I seem to be asking somebody a question just as they're chewing each time. Sorry about that. My comic timing is off today. <laughs> and is it storage or CPU that you've been using? Yeah. OK. Anyone else? Positive or negative experience with the auto scaling? It's, it's still a relatively new feature and we're, we're tweaking it all the time. We're using it now and it's helping us see where we have some patterns in increased usage. Okay. Because we'll see our cluster auto scale up and then it'll auto scale back down. Okay. After whatever trigger happened. Yeah. So that's part of what we're researching right now. So we've got a few folks to Okay. help pinpoint it, but it's helped us see that there's that problem that we need to fix. Yeah, but it could be just the you know, users are more active on a Tuesday afternoon, right? It could be, but yeah. it's not been that way. Okay. So we get the notifications and sometimes it's 11.30 on Thursday and sometimes it's 3.30 on Tuesday. Okay. So it's not any kind of- There's no different pattern. Okay. Right. 
That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's worth digging into it to, to find out more um, yep. on that. Okay, cool. Any other experiences with auto scaling? Glad to hear it's working. Uh, and there's there's improvements coming to that all the time. Um, you know, we want to make sure that it, it scales down to, you don't want to end up in a kind of a hysteresis effect where it's like scaling up and down all the time, you know? Um, so it, it's really hard to do that kind of auto-tuning um, uh, kind of thing, but that's, we're going to be adding those kinds of features in a number of areas uh, over the next couple of years. You can, you can set it so it doesn't scale down, right? Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's work through an example of calculating the working set. Um, so in this case, we've got a number of different types of data in the, in the database. Um, we're developing a mobile game. Um, there's 16 gigs of kind of system data that we have, and we want all of that to be in RAM at any one time. So we want to have as little latency as possible accessing that. So we know we're going to need 16 gigs of memory for, for the, the, the system data. Um, that, that might be how we configure our mobile game. Then we have indexes. Um, we, you know, so we've got a player database here. This is a kind of like identity for the different players in the, in the mobile game we're developing. So we know we're going to have indexes of 32 gigs. We also want all of those in RAM. Um, so that's adding two gig, 32 gigs to our, our bill. And then we want to have roughly a quarter of the player data in memory at any one time. Um, so we know the player data is roughly 500 gigs of data. 25% um, of that is 124 gigs. Um, so if we add all of this up, we've got 172 gigs of RAM for our working set. The thing to remember then is by default, um, the storage engine, the WireTiger storage engine has caches in it. Um, but it, it also did, it, the, the, the in-memory caches for the WireTiger storage engine will try to take up 50% of the physical RAM on, on the server. Um, so when MongoDB starts up, uh, it, it, it tries, to, tries to use that for the storage engine. So ultimately, if we take that 50% into account, we need to double the 172. So for, for this kind of a system, you'd want to have 344 gigabytes. So does, does that make sense in terms of doing the, 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 store, the, the working set calculation? Yeah. You, yeah, you, you, you can change the amount of memory the WireTiger cache is going to use. Um, so you can increase that or decrease it. We were talking to somebody at the break here. It's very workload dependent as to, you know, whether that will improve or, or disimprove the, the performance. Um, so so you, can, you can tweak that for sure. Say your, uh, your system and player data are two different databases or two different collections, do you have a way of telling Mongo or co configuring Mongo so that it, it prioritizes a certain collection or database to be kept in RAM like at 100%? Yeah, not that, not that I know of right now. There's, basically, it's, it, it's a, there's a caching algorithm. Um, so what it's, it's, it's using, you know, there's, there's at, at a high level, it's a variant of what's called a least recently used cache. So it flushes out the least recently used uh, memory. So it should settle down and, you know, I think that what's, what's the joke? There's three hard things in computer, no, there's two hard things in computer science. Naming things, cache and validation, and off by one hours. So, um, <laughs> Damn it! I got it wrong with the three things at the start, but yeah. So so basically, it's it's a cache. You can't prioritize parts of the cache for for collections. I don't I don't I don't know if that's a feature that anyone's asked for or have you heard of that one, Xiao Chen? I think it would be hard to do though. I think there's a feature request for that, but I don't think we're actually working on any of those yet. Yeah. So. Uh, have you seen a need for that? Etienne, is it? Uh, have you seen a need for that, something like that? No? 
Just curious. Okay. Well, but they could be different databases then, right? Yeah. So. Uh, Yeah. You'd like to pin those ones. You want to make sure that those are 100% in memory all the time. But, but then would you not put those in a different database and use the in-memory storage engine? No, for now, we haven't been yet. That's possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, uh, sorry? Or we can run the query in the background again and again. Yeah, yeah. Generating more load on the system, yeah. With the uh, RAM allocation that you have, will you, how do you ensure you get a um, consistent performance with this? Because 25%, the remainder of 75%, you'll have to retrieve from the disk, right? So 25% so, so so of the player data is going to be in RAM at any one time. So like, let's imagine it's, we're, we're building Fortnite. Um, and that's one of the customers we can talk about. So Fortnite runs on, on MongoDB. And they've got their whole customer, you know, user data and all of the different, I don't know, outfits they have and guns and stuff like that. So all of those in-game artifacts are in the database as well. But if, if you looked at just the collection with all of the users, they're not all going to be playing at the same time. So you don't necessarily want to have all of the users who are not playing in memory, right? You know, if, if, if a user logs in, it'll run a query, it'll pull that user into memory. Eventually, it won't be, have been used as recently, and it'll fall out of the caches again. So we want to, we want to, you don't want to keep, you know, if you really care about latency and, and performance of a particular collection and you want it in memory, then the, the in-memory storage engine you could use. But it's, it's not feasible with some data sets. You're not going to be able to afford to, you know, use, create a system that, that has enough memory for all the data. So, so if, you're in, if your system has been running for some time, yeah. your RAM is primed, meaning you know, all the hot data, you have it in the, in the cache, in the memory? Yeah. Now, Atlas does auto, auto the minor upgrades and all those other fancy things? Yeah. So that's a rolling upgrade, right? It's a rolling upgrade. So now yeah. your cache is flushed out, right? Yeah. So now, over time, it's going to prime. Yeah. Right? So, so how do you kind of mitigate the performance? Meaning, yeah, I mean, you, you, you get cold caches at the start when a server starts up. Um, and if, the, like, actually the suggestion made by the gentleman up here in the corner, um, that, that's sometimes what we will do is we'll, we'll warm the caches if there's a particular data set that we care about after a restart. In our internal performance testing um, infrastructure, that cold cache issue can you know, lead to a lot of variability in results. And if we're testing two versions of MongoDB, maybe somebody made a fairly significant change, we want to take that variability out. So in our performance tests, we'll warm the caches by reading the whole collection into memory. Um, so, so that's a tactic that you could use. Yeah, for sure. Yep, thank you. Any other questions on working set? You want a 10 terabyte database example? Yes. OK. Yeah, this one's too small, is it? It's not realistic enough. <laughs> I, I, I can remember when, you know, our, yeah, I mean, 344 gigabytes sounds crazy to me. But anyway, I remember 64 kilobytes of memory. But anyway, and tapes. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll make a more realistic example. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, th yeah. That, I mean, that, yeah. Is, that is a good point. We, we have large data stores as well. And trying to balance the working set and the size of the cluster and the available memory with our indexing needs means that sometimes our indexes aren't able to yeah. fit 100% of the RAM. And so we, we incur a cost of going to, to disk. Yeah. Do you need all the indexes, though? Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> but then that's what we'll talk about in, in a little while. Like a, a common scalability issue we see is the, you, you, a lot of people have indexes they don't need. Um, and, and there's, there's a cost to that. Yeah. But wait, it'll also tell you you don't need some as well. Not as many as it says I need. <laughs> okay, so we need to tweak the index, uh, the performance advisor a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a good point. I don't, yeah, don't always believe what you see on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an advisor, right? It's yeah, yeah, and a lot of this, like, it's kind of trite, but you just gotta kind of try it and see. Like, the the workloads are so different that different customers have. It's very, it's like, it's some of these patterns kind of contradict each other. You know, you gotta, you you can't like kind of. I remember what I was, the Gang of Four book I mentioned earlier. You know, there was like I don't know 50 patterns in there for doing software design, and like. The first time I built a system with that in my head, I was trying to use as many of them as possible, and it was so terribly, horribly complicated. You know, visitor patterns and decorators and everything all over the place. So, you know, they, they, they'll say different things to different people at different times. You know, you, you won't be able to apply all of them. So there's no hard and fast rules, I think. It's, it's about experimentation and observing, you know, having a hypothesis, making a change, observing what actually happened. Um, it's, it's very hard to make hard and fast rules. OK, cool. Some feedback on Performance Advisor. Um, yeah, so th there's some deeper material on this. We could actually spend the whole workshop um, going through um, schema design, basically. Um, so Chris Harris, um, who's a, a product manager now um, in, in Zhao Chen's team, he did a 2020 talk. Um, which was all online, um, but it's actually up on YouTube. Um, so it's called Tips and Tricks for Query Performance. Um, and I've got, I've got a QR code later with a Twitter stream of comments with a direct link to that, so you don't, you don't, have, to, um, you don't have to write that down. Um, the documentation is actually surprisingly good in this area. Um, th so there's a, there's a particular section on data modeling that, that goes into quite a lot of detail. Now, I know everyone here in the room, you know, you do check out the documentation and read the release notes, but you'd be surprised, you know, people outside of this, you'd be surprised at how many people don't read the documentation. And for a database, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of features in there. It's, it's quite complex and powerful. Um, we have a blog series on building with patterns. Um, and they were talking there about patterns of schemas. Um, so it's a little bit of overloading of the term pattern. But there's, there's sp specific schema design best practices for different use cases in that series. So they've got like catalogs, content management, uh, Internet of Things applications, uh, analytics, single view of the customer, th things like that. And, and they've got some specific schema design patterns as well, like versioning, bucketing, referencing, and graphs. Um, and another under re, underutilized resource, MongoDB University, it's a no-cost web-based web training course. They, so they actually have one on data modeling. And, and it's a great way to kickstart your, your learning on, on schema design. Um, so, so I highly recommend that as well. Um, MongoDB University has getting, been getting better and better over the years. So there's, it's, it's kind of an underutilized resource that, that I think is really good. So that's schema design. Any other questions on that before we move on? So the next pattern, number five, index sparingly. We've, we've, kind, of, we've, given, we've kind of given hints uh, forward hints to this one already. We've already kind of talked about it a little bit. So indexes are a key feature of any database. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to go into how indexes work in, in detail. Uh, hopefully you, you, you're all familiar with that already. So you're now at the stage where you've figured out the queries, you've got your schema, um, you're, you're pl planning the queries that you're going to run and the indexes that you're going to need. 
You've already applied pattern number one, so you know you understand the requirements. Um, you know whether read or write performance is more important for you. So the problem here is each additional index consumes additional resources. So the database, you know, when you insert a document, it needs to find a, where to add the index entry. It needs to write that. And then each index uses additional I.O. operations, additional CPU, additional storage on disk, as we, as we mentioned, and in memory. And it consumes cache space as well. When we've kind of tested and benchmarked things ourselves internally, if, if, you, if you imagine an insert heavy workload, maybe bulk writes running, um, and you've got the underscore ID index, uh, and you add an extra index in. That can have, it depends on the type of index, it depends on your type of data, but it could have anything from a five to a 75% impact on your insert workload performance. Is, is that range of numbers surprising to anyone here? It's surprising? It's a big range, yeah. Um, surprising in a good way or a bad way? 75 is a lot, yeah. Okay. Well, it, there's a lot happening under the hood. That's the thing. Uh, and, and it depends on the type of index, and it depends on the, the, the shape of the data as well, and how big the big bee trees are, and how far it has to traverse through them. Anyone else surprised by 75 to 75? Yeah? Sh 5 to 75%. One additional index, yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Well, it's a lot. That, that, I'm kind of trying to shock you here a little bit because the, uh, one of the big problems I always see is like way too many indexes. And, th and that's making the database do a hell of a lot underneath the hood. You know, as I said, each, each, each extra index adds more I.O., more CPU, more storage on disk, it's, it's taking things out of cache. So it's, it, it can have a big impact. Um, you know, the document sizes are a factor as well. The, is there any statistics in Compass that tells you how indexing impacts performance? Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't do it today, and I think it would be a hard thing to build. Um, it, but it's an easy thing for you to do an experiment with and measure. You know, the, the, you have, everyone's got very different looking documents in their database, um, and they've got very different looking workloads as well, and the workloads are changing over time too. It, it's just something I think you need to experiment with. Um, that, like, I, I don't want to diss any competitors or anything. Like, they, ultimately, an index means the, da the database internally is doing a lot more work. So the, one, of, you know, one of the more established, uh, I guess, not more established, but one of the database companies that's been around for a lot longer, um, they've got a, like a 375-page database tuning guide PDF, and what they say is that each index requires about three times as much resources as the actual delete, modify operations on a table. So th their recommendation would be, you know, if you, if you add an index, you, you need to have three times more resources to keep up the same performance. So, you know, in relational databases, that, that impact is there as well. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a question for some of the people who, well, so, um, so bring this conversation, we're kind of nested to the head you had mentioned. Uh, da, 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 index 75%, and I missed it. And so okay. I'm like, here, I have a big variable, and I'm like, trying to say, can you just restate? Re restate the, the, the problem? Okay. Um, You've got an insert workload. Let's say you're inserting 80,000 documents per second. 
right? And you add an index, that could go down to 50,000 documents per second, just by the fact that you have an index on that collection. Is that like forever? Or forever, forever, okay. yeah. Because it's, 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 the database has got to write those indexes. It's got it's to, right. you know, so there's extra IO operations happening. It's got to, it's got to find, you know, where it's going to slot you in based on what it's indexing on. So there's, you're, you're getting the database to do a lot more work. Yeah, but it helps you in read, right? Sorry? It helps you unread, exactly, it does. And that's, that's part of the trade-off between reads and writes and, and what matters, you know. But they, sometimes people will add, you know, um, an index for a read query that might not happen very often, you know, and um, it, it's having a huge impact. Yes? If we delete unused indexes, do we have an idea of how long it will take for the database to like recover its its? Uh, yeah, the deletion of MongoDB is of an index is pretty fast, um, so it's 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 not a very disruptive operation. Um, what we do a lot in our um, internal testing is we'll have a disk snapshot of a large data set. So what's actually faster is if we, if we want to kind of simulate, let's say, you know, four terabytes of data with 10 indexes, we, we, we will basically, you know, insert all that data. It takes a long time. We'll take a snapshot of it. Um, and then if we want to do tests we'll, uh, of different index sizes, we delete. So we start with 10 and we'll, we'll delete databases, delete indexes instead to get down to the different sizes. So rather than going up, we start high and go down. Um, and the, yeah, the, the, the dropping of an index is, is much more efficient. So, uh, uh, sorry. so it's a logical delete or it's a hard delete when you delete the index? It's a delete the pages first and then... Yeah, it's, eventually. yeah, it, and it deletes files on disk and everything as well, so it's, yeah, you're, they're not coming back. You've got to rebuild the index if you, if you drop one. Yes? So, a quick question. Uh, so the insertion to the index and to the, uh, like the data, so they're both synchronous or they're asynchronous operation? As far as you're concerned, they're, they're synchronous. Synchronous. Okay. Yeah. So that's what affects the performance then. Is there a tuning parameter to make it asynchronous? From the insert of a document yeah. point so of like view, if I'm doing an insert, like you said, you know, we are inserting about eighty thousand documents, and if I'm writing like the data and also building the index at the same time, right? That's two operations. If I can decouple them, hey, insert the data, commit, done, and then the index is asynchronous, then I could still get my. Uh, are, are you talking about the index build or the the <laughs> index <laughs> update for a new document insert? Insert, uh, update for new document insert. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to make that asynchronous. There is a way for the index builds. You can build indexes in the background. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's a way to do that yeah, on an cannot, individual uh, insert. You cannot do that because index is a part of your data. Yeah. It's not like a catalog. Oh, it's it's a part of your data. If you do that, you have incorrect query results, inconsistent query yeah. results, right? Um, eventual consistency should catch up of your query. Yeah, um, eventually people... consistent is about if you've got multiple, you know, members of the replica set, multiple separate servers. So eventual consistency is more about, you know, when all of them see the same value. Yeah, okay, so, sorry, was that a question or a statement? I just wanted to restate it for, sorry? It was more of a statement towards the end. If you have that feature, then it would be helpful. Yeah, 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 but it, it so it, it, for, for those who couldn't hear, the, 
the idea was, you know, to, to be able to control that, I guess, at, at a database write level so that for a high transactional load system um, that, but it's adding complexity, right? So, um, actually, like the system that we have, uh, like it's an event-based system, we stream like a lot of events. We have like heavy writes, we yeah. have database. Yeah. 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 So what? Yeah. One similar idea is that so instead of building an index, you can build, you can do like a materialized view. Like we had a session earlier uh, in the MongoDB world talking about you can just materialize some of the views and the use dollar out and write it to, to the same or uh, different collection, and then you can query on that view. So instead of like. A, uh, depending on the system to build the index. Uh, like as, as we mentioned earlier, like the index is part of data. I think for us, the top priority is to keep the data consistency. And so if you want, you're trying to uh, like improve your read performance without impacting write performance, I think you should like look at that materialize, to materialize some of the views and to, to improve You can scale up as a every time. Well, if you have an asynchronous index field, it's the same thing, it's the same thing right? You are, that index can also become stale. Yeah, the, the session, I think it was on Tuesday, Thomas yeah, was, Reutzkis, right um, did that session, and the, the, the video should be up on, on the web of how to do the materialized views that Xiao Chen mentioned. Cool. Multiple replicas, the index is written only once, or how does it work? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh, I think the microphone the mic. is near. Right. Yeah. So in, in, if you have multiple replicas, right, and uh, how does the behind the scenes the indexing thing right works? So, so multiple replica set instances, you mean? So there's a, a replica set with say three MongoDB servers. In, uh -huh. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. So w what happens is the the communication the, the write will happen on the primary, and those writes then get replicated to the to the secondaries. So those are separate database instances. The, when the secondary inserts the document into the database, it, it updates the indexes itself. So it, it has its own indexes. And it's all consistent as far as that con secondary is concerned. Is it blocked for in, on the three uh, replica inserts, or is it blocked for based on? It, is it blocked? Is it blocked? So basically, it's, a, it's a, for example, write operation is blocked on three, all three instances? So, so you, you, can, you can decide that when you're sending the operation. So you can, you can there's all levels of, I guess, write durability that you can, you can specify. So you can say, I want to wait until it's replicated to one. I want to wait until it's in the journal of the primary. You, you have control, so you can, and that's a performance durability trade-off that you can make. Um, so you might care a lot about certain data, and then there might be some streaming data, and if you miss some of it because of a network outage, that's okay. So you might be doing write one for the data you don't care about so much, but you want it to be fast. And you could do write majority, which is the default write concern uh, since MongoDB 5.0. And that will wait, it'll, your, your write operation will wait until it's been replicated to a majority of the replica set. So uh, based on, I think from the field experience, what's the average number of indexes you see as a sweet spot, you know, on a replica set and on sharded deployments? The average number of? Yeah, what's the sweet spot of having number of Indexes on a collection, for example. It, it, it totally depends on your application. Like I've I've seen, I've seen customers with like sixty indexes, okay. you know, which is which I I, I think it's bonkers, you know, because it's just making the database do so much work, and they're using them very infrequently. It it, it all comes down to, you know, the, the, I think the gentleman here in the green jacket earlier, the nice MongoDB jacket, you know, it's a trade-off between the read and write performance. Um, but, you know, if, if you're doing a lot of queries and you can look at the queries and you, look, you, you can see the number of documents examined per document returned, so you can see that ratio, um, 
you know, if you're running a frequent query and it's examining a lot of documents and returning very few, yeah, you probably need an index there. Um, it, it, it totally depends, I'm afraid. It, you need to experiment. Yeah? So would an Atlas search index, would they follow, would that follow the same rules as any other index? The, the Atlas search features, the Lucene index behind yeah, the there's scenes? Search, yeah, like there's a search index and then you have your other indexes that you can build them, them here. Yeah, so th that, th that's a separate search server that's running. It's, it's, it's running Lucene. So th that's kind of like it, it's using chain streams and it's monitoring the data that's going into the database and it's allowing you to do free ser text search then on top across multiple um, fields if necessary. So, so that's a separate system. Yeah. And, and that's going to be a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, the search index is actually, as uh, Jerry mentioned, run, uh, built in and uh, maintained in the Mongo T instead of Mongo D. And also that is actually a, a asynchronized index. Yeah, that's a, so, so that might not be up to date completely. So if, if you added a new, um, uh, you know, if you had a store kind of application and there's a new tent available or something like that, it's going to show up in the search, in this search engine. A couple of seconds later, it's it's not it, that's not completely synchronized. It's actually a separate server under the hood. Yes. Uh, would you say hiding indexes is better than deleting indexes? Less more costly. If you're not going to need them, I'd delete them. You know, um, yeah, it's it's people are you'd be surprised at how much work the database is doing under the hood for the extra indexes. Yeah. Index stats. Yeah. Index stats. Yeah. yeah. There's a, the, so Atlas makes it a lot easier in the UI. You can see how how heavily used an index is. There's, there's ways of figuring it out as well plus. from from the, the the shell commands. Plus, plus um, you can you can use the set the index to invisible as well, so the application won't use it, but it will still be maintained. And if you're good with invisible and you know that it's not going to be useful, you can drop it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. That's a new feature. If it's accessed the next time, it will be able to read it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. My question is. Uh, <clears throat> creating a new index on a super large collection. Yes. So back in the days, we were told that the best practice is do it index built in a rolling fashion, meaning yeah. you take it to standalone mode, build the index, put it back to the cluster. Yeah. The reason for doing that is so as not to be impactful to the primary. Yeah. Now, with the newer versions of MongoDB, is that still necessary or we can just run in a primary in background and that's it? Personally, I, I would I would still do you would still do that fashion. Yeah. I, I, I got tired of doing that because we have yeah. a, a fifteen member replica set. Yeah, I know. And I yeah. and I tell myself it's just too much than what but we did. If you use Ops Manager or if you're using Atlas, yeah. it, it yeah. will automate. I, I do that. Mongo Shell, right? Okay. So it's, it's just too much work, so I just decided. Hands on. <laughs> no so, UIs. So I just decided to tell to say uh, you know what, just do it in a primary, send in background and see what happens. So it seems uh, it seems okay. It seems okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so my question to you was that you said you think it's still necessary as a best practice to do in rolling fashion. How do you how do you I, know? I, I would. How do you yeah. know whether you should go for the hard way to do it or the easy way, as just I described? How do you know? At what point do you do you decide? Yeah, I mean the the background index builds have been defined, and I think actually the default changed. So in the past, the default for an index build was a foreground index build, and I change, think because so many people built a foreground index on their production primary, you know, they caused a huge problem, so we switched it to background being the default. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I it, 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 you know, background is way better than foreground. It's, it's still impactful, you know. If it was me, I'd still always do 
rolling, and and then I'd and then I'd actually use Ops Manager and the Ops Manager API to automate it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Get out of the shell, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I scripted my own actually. You scripted your own? <laughs> okay. And 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 that's that's quite easy to do, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. But still, it takes a long long process, you know, end to end, you know. Yeah. Instead of just fire and forget and come back to it. Yeah, but if if you use if you use Atlas, you could fire and forget, and it would do it in a rolling fashion, and uh, you know, but that's not possible for everyone I know. Yeah. Hey, you have a new feature, cluster to cluster syncing, yeah. right? So, um, is the idea that we can have a second cluster that would be more for analytics purposes that will have like more a different set of indexes yeah. than the, the first one? Well, you, you can do that with just a replica set today. Oh, we can. Yeah. Okay. So you could you could have the, the so you could have um, I think we've probably mentioned it here later. It's one of the patterns. Um, so we're kind of a bit fore foreshadowing or jumping ahead. So you you could have a member of the replica set with extra indexes for say an analytics query, and then you can configure that so it can never become primary. So you. you you know, but that it, still impacts your write performance? No, it, no doesn't. it doesn't. So, so what happens is the replication protocol, your primaries and all the potential primaries, um, they take part in the replication protocol and the acknowledgments to say enough members of the replica set have the value. So if, you, if it was a write to the majority, they would take part in that. The, that extra analytics replica set member doesn't take part in that voting at all because it can never become the primary. So that can then have, you could, you could, you could have, and I think we're building this into Atlas now so that you could have an M60 for the analytics um, secondary and it, it can't become primary. It could have extra memory. It could have extra indexes for those um, so it can actually be running slower, but that's okay. It'll have some extra replication lag, but and it can configuration-wise, like how hard is it to to maintain and you know and send commands specific to particular? How hard is it to maintain? Well, yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of customers using using that approach. Um, you you know, it, it, it's all configuration files. To, you know, so once you've set it up and it's up and running, you know, it, 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 there's no kind of constant maintenance, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, that, that'll work very well. And, and then it's easier. I don't, I don't want to be, I'm, okay. I'm an engineer. Great. I'm not I trying to sell you anything, but okay. it's easy in Atlas, you know, uh, to do that. Uh, Thank you. It, Would you maybe repeat the question with the microphone? I don't want to get too close to this one because I was uh, worried sure. about feedback. So my question is, is there any kind of guidance when you're basically setting up a collection and you're getting kind of you know uh, data inside a collection? You have how many childs you want to have inside it? Sub-documents, you mean? Sub-documents, yeah. yep. There, there's no real guidance. You can nest them quite deeply. Um, but the, the query engine, when it's running, kind of traversing the, those sub-documents, that's extra work that it needs to do. Um, right. And that's something, actually, that we're trying to tune at the moment for some um, optimizations or improvements to the query engine. So you know, it, it's a very flexible thing. And I've, I've seen customers with really deep document hierarchies. Um, 
it's it's going to be more work for the database to traverse those. Right. So uh, it, uh, yeah, but it's really a case of trying it and 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 see. Most most of the time, you know, design it so that it's easy for your developers to begin with. Um, but sometimes flattening those deep hierarchies, it, it could actually have a performance. So there's impact. some level of design. There's some. It's not huge. Yeah. It's not gotcha. something really to to worry about uh, uh, overly. But uh, I do know that we're developing a new feature at the moment, and if we've got a very deep document hierarchy, we saw a regression with that, and that's something that we coughed before we got to a release. Um, so there is an impact, you know. Um, an index is an extreme example. I'm kind of trying to scare you here um, a, a little bit because it's, it's causing the database to do so much more work. All of those little things, they, they add up, you know. Got you. Thank yeah. you very much. OK. Any other questions? I can't remember even which pattern we're on. Do you remember? Um, indexes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, index sparingly. I had a picture of a, a pig with a, a mask there. Let's let's see what else we have. So yeah, the five to seventy-five percent that uh, that we reiterated earlier. So we need to get the balance uh, right between um, the write and read performance. Um, it also, each, each index you add uh, impacts your initial sync time as well. Um, so it's got to build the indexes on the secondary um, when the in initial sync completes. And uh, as we saw, they usually improve the performance of, of queries, but not always. So the solution is um, check to make sure that you're using the indexes. You can run and explain on the queries that you're running. Uh, to see if the indexes you expect are actually being used and that they actually improve performance. Um, so pre-production, you could run experiments. You could drop an index. You could uh, check the logs to see if you're now getting a lot of slow queries. Um, by default, the log file will show any query that took over 100 milliseconds. Um, and you can check that threshold. So sometimes an indication of a performance problem is if you've got large log files. Um, you know, that's you know, either because of slow queries or there's lots of connections being established to the database server itself. And Atlas makes this uh, a lot easier. Um, there's the performance advisor in Atlas. It makes usage recommendations, as, as we heard earlier. Um, sometimes you maybe don't want to take all of the recommendations. Um, and then another thing to think about is uh, using a compound index. So that's one where you can build an index using multiple fields of, of the document. Um, and we'll see examples of that uh, in the next pattern. Yes. Yeah. So you went into one of the secondary, take it down to standalone mode, drop one of the indexes and put it back to the cluster. Uh, will we stay that way forever? Will Mongo ever come to complain at any point in the future? It, it won't complain. I mean, that's a valid thing that you can do. The, the problem is if that secondary ever gets elected to be the primary. Yeah, this is a non-voting member, so I don't yeah. care. So the reason I want to do that is let's say, hey, this node is running out of space. I'm trying to yeah. get rid of indexes whom I know will not be used on this secondary. That's why I want to do something like that. Yeah, but you see, <laughs> any, any secondary that can become primary can become primary, right? So I know, your but it's a non-voting member. So it's a non-voting member. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, you've, so that's fine then. That's, and fine. that's kind of the opposite of the example we had earlier with the, the analytics. Yeah. Secondary. Mongo, Mongo um, won't complain any time in syncing up. It won't ever, complain. Right? It won't, it won't complain. complain. But yeah. just make sure it's a. I, I know it's bizarre, but. Yeah. <laughs> make sure it can't become the primary. That's all I'd suggest. Uh, you briefly mentioned uh, database connection counts. 
how much is too much and is there a way to like measure the impact? Like in my case, we, we run a bunch of Python scripts in parallel uh, that each do like specialized things. So each of them create a connection Opens to the, the connection. database. Yeah. So uh, I can see in the log sometimes like it goes above like 200 connections. Yeah. And I'm wondering, okay, how far is too much? Yeah, and unfortunately, the answer is it depends. We have a whole pattern on connection management, um, which we'll go into in a lot more detail in a little while. There's, there's I guess, two important factors. First, there's a, there's a connection pool. Most drivers manage a connection pool. So they'll actually spin up connections at the start, and you can tailor the, the settings to decide how many connections you want it to have, and you can set a limit as well. So as you make calls into the driver to send operations, it, it will reuse pre-existing connect connections from the pool already. Yeah, that might not work, though, if each of these the, there scripts is a script is and it has its own pool, basically. Yeah, so yeah. if each script is spawned by a different container, then there's no yeah. way they can share yeah. the pool. Yeah, so in, in, in that case, what I'd suggest is, like, how many kind of concurrent operations would each of those scripts be doing? It can be a lot. It depends on, on workloads. OK, so there's not a lot of concurrency. For each connection, how many database operations would it be running? Too hard to say. Right, to, like quick. But it could be a big number? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Well, that's all, that's all right. What, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the ratio of operations run to the number of connections is quite high. So an anti-pattern I've seen is a customer will write an application. It, it establishes a connection. It runs, runs one operation, and then it closes down the, the, the connection again. So like there's so many messages, just the TCP handshakes or the TLS handshakes, of which there are even more of them. There's, there's so much going on there for that one small piece of work. So you want to make sure there's a lot of operations per connection. So if you're seeing a lot of connections in the log, and, and the log file shows every new connection established, established, that's an issue. In your case, for those scripts running in, in containers, yeah. I'd say reduce the size of the connection pool. But th that helps, because a lot of those scripts are short-lived. So yeah, if yeah. we can like, just really prevent small. them from, from starting by doing a pre-query before, uh, that, that will help. Yeah, well, it just, just making it a small pool. The, I, I think, to be honest, the pool, si the pool defaults, we, we've got them wrong. So you, you, I would take the pool size down really small okay. on those. Yes? You can see the connections, the number of connections, yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Number of tickets? Something yeah, the wire tiger tickets, yeah. So what, 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 is, what correlation that has to the number of connections, you know, that you have? What correlations does it have to the number no, of connections? It's limited to 100 tickets, right? It, you, can, you can configure it. So do you remember the diagram we had earlier? where we had a queue, Little's Law, we had a queue and then a number of service threads reading from the queue. So inside MongoDB, there's a separate component for the low-level storage engine, right? So there's the, the main MongoDB that has all the algorithms for queries and the query engine and all those pieces. And then when it's going to actually store things on disk, so there's lots of different components in the software. The interface between the main MongoDB database and that storage engine uses those tickets, right? So the WireTiger storage engine has a thread for each of those tickets, and it's reading work requests. So it's almost like an extra kind of server inside the database server itself. So you can control the amount of parallelism and the number of threads that are running in the Wire Tiger component of the database by changing those ticket numbers. So if you, if you don't change the default, it's 128 reads and 128 writes, then when you see those ticket numbers going down, it, it means that the storage engine is really busy. If it goes high. If it goes low, the number remaining goes low, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it'll actually run a lot more threads internally. And when you have a lot more threads, they'll be context switching. There'll be contention between them if they're using a shared resource. So you, but the, go, going to that level of tuning is not something I would recommend at an early stage. That's, you know, that, that's kind of the black art kind of stuff um, that, you know, if we know for sure that that's the problem, you know, we, we'll, we'll start tweaking that uh, and advising you on how to tweak that. Um, it came up yesterday in the, um, in the, um, the, 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 um, the Ask Me Anything session that we did, the shorter one. Um, and, and it can be used for kind of changing the balance between read and write. You can, you can you know, reduce the number of write tickets and keep the number of read tickets high. But it's something I wouldn't recommend messing with. You know, we'd, we'd need to be sure that that's really where the bottleneck is. Because I've, I've seen people just waste a lot of time going down into that level of detail, and, and then it, it doesn't really make a difference. The bottleneck was somewhere else. That's why the earlier section about knowing where the bottleneck is, all those 20 different places, that's the key. It's all about finding where we think the bottleneck is right now. And it will be there sometimes, but most of the time it's not. But for some peop reason, people are gravi gravitate towards that, and it's a big time suck, to be honest. Wow, indexes. Who would have, oh, yes, I knew I saw a hand up. Sorry. I also need to leave from earlier. So will you have share these uh, slides uh, um, on the later next week call? the recording next week because there are so many interesting questions yeah. you want the slides to be available yeah, yeah. no the, this the slides will definitely be available i because I, I uploaded a, a pdf so I, I believe they'll be publishing the the, the pdf How of the slide this whole session recording? um i didn't think they were recording it but it, we were talking to um, the, the, our helper there down in the corner, and he says it's actually being recorded. It's all being recorded. So there is a recording. I'll be honest, I'm not gonna watch it. I hate hearing my own voice and seeing myself on video, but uh, hopefully it will be recorded and made available. Um, and all the recording and slides will be available by next Monday. Okay. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So, yeah, you're probably gonna receive an email or notification about that. Thank you. Yeah, so, hi kids. <laughs> we are actually guided to the white wild tiger um, documents. That's what I think is there some gap between the Mongols documents and the wild tiger, because the wild tiger documents all are externalized, kind of. So people are not easy to um, add, uh, connect the dots. From, yeah. For from, example, for our case, it's the, the data handles, too many data handles from at the wild tiger level. Yeah, so the, the, the too many data handles issue sometimes happens if you've got a huge number of collections. Is, is that the, the situation in your case? Yeah, exactly the case. But it's actually because of our permission and we have the data connecting created, but it's actually not being used. It's not the receipt. It's keeping the memory and uh, the, the, the collect in the file cache, I would say. Yeah, so we've made progressive improvements on that over oh. the years. So it really depends on the, the version that you're on. Yeah, the um, latest version. You're on the latest version? Yeah, I think the last will always yeah, push us to. Yeah, upgrade. so you're on version 5.0 at the uh, moment? 5.5. I think something like that. Okay. The, um, actually, we should talk about version numbers a little bit as well, um, the, uh, as a side bar to your question. Um, but first, yeah, huge numbers of collections can incur some strange stalls. Um, the, the, again, it's a case of it's doing a, an awful lot of work under the hood. Um, so yeah, like, but we, we've been testing, you know, thousands and tens of thousands now. But you know, having a huge number of collections, that that would be a bit of an anti-pattern. I, I would try to minimize the number if if you can. 
Um, just on, on version numbers, this is maybe a little bit confusing, but the, uh, is everyone familiar with the rapid releases and how we changed that in the last couple of years? So there's a, there's a quarterly release now. Um, the the 5.0 version, so this 5.0 came out last summer, July or something like that, and then each quarter there's 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. So 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 will have new experimental features kind of at an early stage of their development. Um, whereas 5.0 is the one that we recommend you run with in production. Um, and like 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 are almost kind of previews for 6.0. So I don't know if people re realized that that's kind of the way that the, the numbering scheme works. And maybe it's an opportunity to give us some feedback. But if, if I was you and I was in production, I would be on 508, whatever the latest point release is of 50. That, that's the one I, I would suggest you run in production. So yeah, if, if you're running something, don't, don't be using 5.3. Um, does that make sense? I know it's a little bit confusing, but it's, um, and, and, it, and if it's caused anyone to be on the wrong version, um, let us know. We can either improve the documentation or change how we number these things. Oh, wow, okay. All right then, that's indexes. We're moving along. <laughs> ESR rule. Chris's talk goes into this into a huge amount of detail. So I'm just gonna kind of give you some, some pointers here. So uh, in this case, we're planning the indexes we want to use, and you've decided to use a compound index. Um, so a compound index basically is an index built with multiple fields of the document. And you can actually specify the order of those fields as it, as it builds the index. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to use the same index for multi to speed up multiple queries. Um, so let's go back to our example from the, from the books. Um, so in this case, we have two queries. The first one finds the most recent 10 reviews for a specific book. So you could imagine your, your, your Amazon, you're showing a particular book, you want, to, you want to show 10 of them. And then the second query might be used if the user selects a filter option on the web page. So they might want to see only five star reviews or only the one star reviews or only the reviews from the country that they're in, for example. So we've got two queries that, that we're, we're trying to optimize, basically. Um, so you can see the first one there. It's sorting it, but showing the most recent first, and it's limiting it by 10. And in the second case, we want to see the, the ratings that are greater than five. So we're starting from the, the queries. So what are the forces that we need to consider here? So w as we talked about in the last pattern, each index reduces write performance, so we want to keep the number of indexes to a minimum. And secondly, the field order matters in the compound index. So a very simple kind of rule of thumb to use here when building a compound index is to order the fields uh, using the acronym ESR. So that stands for equality, sort, and then range. So we'll go through some examples. So in the book example we had earlier, the ISBN number is the equality field. So it'll filter out all of the other books. So that's the one we want to use as the first element of the, the compound index. And then date is the one that we're gonna be sorting by. Um, so so that's, that's, that's the second element. And then rating is the range. Um, so we only want to see four stars or more. So that, that's the order that we would build the compound index in. And then you can use that index for doing only ISBN queries. Um, you know, so it, it'll use that one index if you're just looking for books with a certain ISBN. Um, and then it, it, if, you, if you, you can combine that with dates and then later add on ratings as well. So it's the same index will be used. 
it's not a hard and fast rule. It really depends on the cardinality of the values in the fields. So if you've got like a Boolean value, um, it, it, you might not, um, you might not. So it really needs experimentation pre-production. Pre so let's see. Yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule. So that's the ESR rule. I think there's a whole talk by Chris uh, on, on the ESR rule on, on YouTube. So bulk rights. It's easier mo to move things around in bulk, basically. So in this case, you might be writing many documents to the same collection. You might be I inserting new documents or updating existing ones. And, and the problem here is, each operation is a, is a network round trip to the database, and that, that's ultimately called latency. So if you're sending up, if your application works in, in a very serialized way, it'll wait for an operation to complete before sending the next one. So you're not taking the opportunity to hide that latency of the data, running the database operations to, to store the data. So basically that serialization means it takes longer. So the part of the problem here is it's, it's a write intensive workload and, and, and it's individual operations. So what you can do is you can actually send a, a bulk operation. So it'll, you know, the, the, the problem with bulks then is what if something fails? What if one of the documents fails to write? It complicates your, your error handling essentially. So the solution here is there's, there's a number of operations, bulk write or insert many, and it, it allows you to basically build an array in your application and, and then basically insert all of those. So it can be for inserts, updates, or deletes. And then there's two ways of modifying this. You can have an ordered option. Uh, if that's true, it's gonna process the operations in the order in the array. And if an error happens, um, it will tell you, it will stop and tell you exactly uh, how far you got. Whereas if ordering is false, the database will, to try to optimize things and go faster, it can process things out of order in the array that you provide, and it won't stop if there's an error. So you'll you receive an error afterwards uh, that will detail what went wrong. So it just complicates the error handling. Okay. So that's bulk writes. So we're going to take another quick break here. Um, how long do we have left at the moment is two? Like 45, 50 minutes left. So what about we don't take a break? If you want to run for the restroom and you can go, just keep it quiet, make sure other people can continue to be here and listening to the talk. Uh, yeah. I don't want to get people like delayed. On yeah, exactly. So there's another opportunity to use the happiness store here and give us some feedback. I think uh, earlier we were going too, too slow, and now we've probably slowed down even further, so um, I won't try to influence the poll. Um, we'll try and make some adjustments. And when we come back, we'll talk about sharding. Thanks very much. So we're not taking a break. We're going to switch no, over. We'll just, we'll just switch, uh, switch over. If you need to run to the restroom or get coffee, feel free to go. Just keep it a little bit quiet. So we get so other people can we can continue and we get you guys to go home on time all right finally my turn and <laughs> i know everyone still here you are hardcore performance guys i like it and i appreciate it so i'm gonna speed up a little bit so make sure we still have time in the end for some other questions uh, so for the next section we're going to talk about sharding and scaling actually we should call it scaling and sharding uh, as jerry mentioned uh, in the pattern number eight, we're gonna talk about manage uh, connections. So for the context, it's like, uh, how many of you write your own driver to connect to MongoDB? I'm curious. Any of you do that? Okay, nobody does that, great. So most of the drivers uh, they, uh, released by MongoDB are third-party partners, are open sources. Uh, we, like, they implement a connection pool to help you to manage your connections.
So even though you, sometimes you are connect, uh, connecting through uh, ORM, the object, relation, uh, re, uh, re, the object relational mapper, uh, this underlying, they're still using a driver. It could be a Java driver, it could be a Python driver, it could be a Node driver. Uh, so you, you can still uh, configure the connection, connection pool uh, through this ORM. So I'll just show, like this shows you like how, again, you already see this before, this is like how your application is going to connect to MongoDB. And in most of the drivers, you, in the beginning, you will uh, create an object, either called Mongo clients, sometimes it's called Mongo clients. And so this object is, first of all, it's thread safe, and then uh, they help you to manage and allocate the connections uh, so to help, and then your, your application and your code can connect to MongoDB, write or read data through those connections. So in each of the, in each of the connection pool, there are two most important things you can configure. The first one is called minimum pool size, another one is called maximum pool size. Uh, so we, we don't guarantee like every single driver will implement the, uh, both. And so as Jerry mentioned, we probably have a, not a very optimal maximum pool size, which is default by 100. That might be a little bit too much for some of the applications, especially nowadays people are always creating microservices, and I'm gonna get there later. And so the minimum pool size default is zero. Uh, so, so, some connection, so that means like some connections in your connection pool will be active, which means they're like really connecting to the, to the MongoDB and doing something, and some of, some of them like are inactive, which means we keep the connection open, but we don't, we're not using it. So when your application is trying to get a connection, to get to connect to MongoDB, it will first look at, oh, if there's any active connection I can use. Um, so that is, so, and then if there's, active connection, it will just grab an existing connection from the connection pool. So that avoids this handshake between your application and MongoDB. And you know, to, make, to establish a connection, you need to have a TCP IP handshake. And if you use, like, uh, if you use a secure connection, it's gonna take even like, more resources. And if there's not enough connections and your connection pool is, didn't reach the maximum pool size, it will just create a new connection and uh, handle this connection to your code to run your queries. And the manual connection, uh, let's just move on. So the problems we see here is that connection, they are not free. So they also use resources, even you're not doing anything. Just keep them open, you, it will take threads, it will take a file describer, and it will take RAM. It will take memory from your server just to keep those connection, connection open, even you don't do anything. And on the other side, if you always do like connect to the database, run a query, disconnect, that will also impact performance because you establish connection also introduce the cost. Like I said, TCP IP handshakes, and if you use secure connection, SSL, TLS, gonna introduce even higher cost for, for establishing a connection. And also sometimes you will see, I would say oftentimes, you will see back pressure uh, by like, you have like a number of connection building up. Uh, usually that's not caused by the connect database connection itself. It could be like the issue on the other part of your database server. Uh, for example, you have like slow running queries and you are running out of CPUs, you are running out of memories. So that, w that costs the application to keep trying to connect, connect to, your, uh, to your database and uh, because if I run a query failure, okay, let me get back to, so I was an uh, architect building machine learning and AI applications before I joined MongoDB. So there are two things make me a headache when people talk to me about it. The first one is microservices. The second one we call the cloud design pattern, AKA retry pattern. So if you design a bad retry pattern, that will give you a very high chance to get back pressure. So how many of you have seen uh, while to try catch and just retry everything indefinitely, right? I believe some of you have seen that. That's like a horrible retry pattern. It will just kill your database. Because when something happens, you keep trying to get your database to do something while your database cannot do that. And it will easily bring your database down. And another thing, uh, 
another thing I'm talking about here is like microservices. Because of micros, it's, it's almost the same issue with uh, Python script. Like you have Python script running in a lot of individual uh, containers, pods, and each of them will need to manage their own connection pools. And they probably don't need that many connections, but if I'm a developer, I'm not DBA, I don't really care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna require 100 connections. I don't care what other people are gonna do. So it ended up you have like many, many connections which, which, which is not being used. So uh, there are some forces here we need to look at. So the first, one, the first thing is that, so uh, either we, if, if you can create more connections, you will be able to be able to do more things. Like you can have multiple threads running queries in the same application at the same time. And, and also, as I mentioned, you can configure the minimum pool size to warm up your connection pools. So when you, uh, when you create this Mongo client object, it will also already have some connection open, and when you need to run queries, you don't have to establish a connection. So that will give you a better latency when you're run, running a MongoDB query. But at the same time, the minimum pool size will also increase the total number of connection. So imagine if you have you, you set a minimum pool size, let's, let's say I said, like as a selfish developer, I set it to 100. So that means every time when I start my application, I establish 100 connection to my MongoDB server. And f if you are using, for example, an Atlas M0 instance, Atlas M0 instance only allow you to have 500 connections, which means if you have six of those applications running, done. Either your database is done or your application is done. So we need to find like a good balance here between like setting a large number of min minimum pool size and a smaller number of minimum pool size. So the solution here is that first of all, we can look at the log or the performance panel uh, just showed earlier for Atlas uh, to see like how many connections has been established and what are we doing in those connections. We should avoid like very simple, uh, small queries using uh, single connections. Maybe we can just accumulate more operations uh, every time when we connect to a, to a database. And also, after we calculate, calculate the usage, we can tune our applications to better leverage the database connections. So uh, we're gonna show you an example here. So this is what I'm talking about, microservices. This is not even micro enough because I only have four microservices here for my application. I've seen like have 20, even 30 pods running as microservices for a single very simple application. Uh, so four is not crazy. But even you only have four microservices, microservices and let's assume you have three members uh, in your MongoDB cluster, one primary, two secondary, and you don't do nothing to set the maximum pool size in your, in your driver. So the default is 100. So in, in this case, you will have a, a, a thousand and two hundred connection built up for each of your application server. So in this case, you can still handle it with M0 because you have 500 per node. So you can have 1500 in total. But let's say I have five application servers and each of them running four microservices is the same configuration, and still I have a 100 macam pool size. So in this case, you will have 2,000 connections to each of the member. I mean 2,000 to primary, 2,000 to each of the secondary, uh, which means if you're using a, a Atlas uh, M0, even like M10, you cannot handle this load, connection load. So, so what I'm go going to show, showing you here is that you have to configure your minimum pool size, maximum pool size when you're writing your code to make sure that you uh, best leverage the database connections and don't be that selfish developer and make sure everybody can use the database and database can leave. Oops, what's, go what's going on here? Oh, okay. So uh, as, a as a database and application is running, sometimes you probably see, oh, my application is running slow. So in that case, there could be two issues, like in general. So uh, one possibility is that the limitation is on your application side. 
So your, apply, your application itself is running slow, and your database is not reaching the maximum, lim, uh, maximum capacity which it can handle yet. So in that case, you may want to increase the maximum pool size to allow more things to be done in your application, and, and more, like more, more queries can run concurrently in your database. And in some other cases, uh, you could have uh, the, the, limit fact, the database as the limiting factor, which means your database is out of capacity, or really, really busy, or have too many connections to, and too many queries to handle. So in that ca case, we may need to use like a little bit counterintuitive strategy here. So instead of increasing the maximum pool size, which people think, oh, because it's running slow, let me just increase the maximum pool size. We, you probably want to think about like reduce the load for the database and reduce the maximum pool size. So the database can at least do something instead of crash, instead of like be, not be able to handle uh, any of the workload. Uh, question? I'll repeat, what's the symptom if a, man, a database reaches the maximum connections it can handle? Will any mm -hmm. new attempt to create a connection just hangs until something frees up? Uh, so this, they, they could, it could be different symptoms. It depends on like what kind of workload you're running. It, you could be reaching the maximum CPU, you could be reaching the maximum uh, memory, or uh, maximum uh, IOPS. And on the client side, you also see, see client side query failures. Like I can, you cannot establish more connections, and also you could, you could sometimes you could establish the connection, but the query will fail. So it's totally depend on like what type of workloads you're running. It'll typically it'll block. It, yeah. 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 On the way. Testing with two. Hey, I have a question. I have a question, or yeah, uh, as it relates to connection pools. So, um, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't actually write code to do this, but I I've read like a good amount of documentation that said it's possible, or I have done this. So, in the case of um, massively parallel fanal operations, you have a lambda that says go do this thing, but you call a hundred and then a hundred, and so you have one thousand all. Oh connecting to Mongo and let's just say inserting or doing some operations. So um, let's just say it's cold start, so you know these lambdas are sleeping. Uh, or maybe they're warm start, so you already have them alive. For every individual child, you're creating new connections, new driver and whatever pool. So my question is, or have you seen or is it recommended that you have another service which has those connections as a service? So there's a lambda that says, get my connection to Mongo and then that can be reused. Either it can be regenerated and it's terminated, so each child, if it's warm or if it's sleeping, it's alive, maybe, the, maybe that one is warm or yeah. that one's alive, or alternatively, it can even be reused. So is that something that you've seen done? Is that something you recommend or something you recommend against? Yeah, uh, of course. I mean, it depends on your need, right? We have that thing which is called gateway, or load balancer. And basically, you can put a gateway or load balancer between your application and MongoDB, which can help you to manage how many connections are you going to uh, connect, how many connections you're going to build to MongoDB, and if you have like a different databases, how many connections can can be routed to each of the databases. So yeah, yeah, that's def definitely something can be done. And depending on like how heavy your uh, how heavy your uh, your application is, uh, depending on the database and how many connections you are making, a because adding a gateway, adding a load balancer, first of all, introducing more cost, additional cost. And not only, I'm not only talking about money, also management cost. And also it increases the, late, the total latency for your query because you have one more hoop added in the round trip. And, and what would you say as far as like the object creations? Let's just say your driver has some specialized configurations. Let's just say it takes one second to create this driver, maybe even more. Um, would you, have you seen driver generate like regeneration or driver caching in between like microservices? Uh, I haven't seen anything of Jiro so you. Okay. An unsolved problem. Yeah, yeah I, I, th I thought it'd be really cool, but I guess I didn't have the guts to try it out, or like it just didn't. Yeah, maybe I'll be something. I'll have. Yeah. Are, yeah. You know, it worked for them. Yeah. 
That is that is a problem that we're thinking about. At the so maybe maybe next year you'll show us how that was successful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hopefully, I, I have an idea. So if you can reduce, uh, go back to that form and put this recommendation in the. Uh, in the, the, form, the uh, form, we can follow up with our driver team and see yeah. if there's anything kind of Yeah, happen. yeah. That's another question, Joe. Um, a Kubernetes microservice example, let's say it's eight nodes, 30 pods per node. They're doing reading one record or max 25 records. So using M60 three node cluster is the two, th so I'd set the minimum to one, the mm -hmm. maximum I divide it up for the entire Kubernetes cluster by 2,000, or 2,000 per node. If I have a three nodes, do I have 6,000? Uh, so the, uh, I want to understand if uh, see if I understand the question correctly. So you want to see like if you have uh, a bunch of pods and a bunch of uh, in your Kubernetes cluster, and each of them are connecting to M60 Atlas database, and you want to see like what is the maximum pool size you should set, like the optimal maximum pool size. And you want to see, let's say, if the connection limit for M60 is, let's say, 2,000. I don't know, like, I don't remember what that is. Like, like how do you calculate the maximum pool size? Is that correct? Yes, I'm looking for the formula. Sure. The minimum I always set to one. So right. I don't want to sure. wait. For, you mm -hmm. know, I want instantaneous response for the microservice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm trying to calculate the the max size of makes, each pod. Yeah, that makes total sense. So I think the first question you should ask is like, how many connections do you need for each of your connect for, for each of your application? If you only need let's say three connections, there's no reason you set it to five or six, like any la number larger than three, because that's eliminated the possibility for you to scale, like scale out in advance, right? If you are, what if you want to add more parts? Then you have to as a reset all the configuration, or you have to scale up your Atlas cluster. So I think, first of all, it should be based on your business needs and the need from your application. And second of all, you mentioned that, oh, should I do like 2,000 divided by the total number of pods? Uh, I won't recommend that because not, so the connections are not only consumed and used by the client applications, and some of the internal applications, internal services are also using some of the connections. So I would say you should give like a, like a buffer there. And so, for example, you, you leave like five, uh, 100 or 500, I, I don't have like a arbitrary number here, certain number of connections for the system usage, and also people could connect to your database from Mongo SH or from Compass, right, to run some ad hoc queries. So you need to allocate the connection for those type of operations, and then you can say, okay, I have 1,500 uh, left, and I can distribute to all my pods. Okay, so you just look up the maximum at a single node based on your scaling. Yeah. Subtract 10% for overhead and 20% um, for overhead. And sure, do, do I, yeah, I think 10. I think something close to that. It, the other thing to take into account is where is the bottleneck, right? So if, if, if the, data, the MongoDB database, the M60, is not heavily loaded, you need to get more parallelism. You need to be generating more load from the pods and the application servers. So you want them to be running more connections, more operations in parallel. So it, it, it's a balancing act. You need to go the other way if MongoDB is the, the bottleneck and you don't want to go up from M60. It's always the bottleneck, okay. So then limit it as much as possible. Um, so reduce the max pool size. Any other question about connections before we move forward to sharding? Okay, uh, so for the next pattern, we're gonna talk about scaling. So I know this, uh, big challenge for most of the projects. So the context here is that you are still in a pre-production or very early stage for your application. And it could be a new application or it could be like, uh, it could be like you're migrating existing application uh, and you're dealing with a very small data set. 
And at the same time, you, because you attended this, today's session and you are practicing it, you are following the pattern number one, which is understand the requirement. And often the case is that you will find out, okay, later in the stage that my application could grow big. I could have more users for my application, and each of the users can be more active using my applications. So our recommendation is that you should think about scaling of your application from day one. Even though you don't have to take actions, but when things happen when you need to, you will have an action plan to say, oh, this is how I'm gonna do scaling uh, once the business needs are there. So talking about scaling, the problems are, first off, first off there are two typical types of scaling. One is scale up, another is scale out. So scale up is the more straightforward one. I'm just adding more CPUs, cores, more memories, buying more expensive disks, disks which can uh, run faster. And, but at some, in some cases, scaling up is, can be very costly, and in some cases, become impossible. So for example, there's no way you can run Google in a single machine, right? And another reason uh, of scaling up is, scale, sometimes scaling up is difficult is because uh, there will be a like, victim of success, like when you, especially when you have a very large database. So I, was, I heard like uh, some people mentioned 10 terabyte database, and when I, work, when I used to work with my previous employee, I, we had a customer, they have a 70 terabyte database. Anyone can guess how long it takes to restore that database? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? Okay, the answer is, what do you say? So based on the Coinbase ETL talk, I would say like between three and six hours. Three to... Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not a, it's not a MongoDB. It's a relational database. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Forever, right? Uh, the answer is I don't know, because nobody had the gut to try it. <laughs> yeah, this it's not it's impossible. It's impossible to restore the database, and it's it's even impossible to backup the database because the database is so big. And there's also other problems with large data. For example, building an index. It's gonna take so much time to build and rebuild an index on a large data set. So you don't, like, like I'm not saying scale up is not, it's a bad thing. When scale up is the right solution, you should use scale up, but you don't want scale up be your only uh, solution here. So another way to do scaling is to scale out. And so you can partition and distribute your data into independent servers. And here I'm gonna show you like two different ways to do scale out. So first of all, uh, this is, again, this uh, software system we showed in through this whole talk. So the first way to do it, you can distribute your data by the purpose. So for example, you can have a database for user information, you can have a database for account information, you can have a third database for all the trans user transactions, and, and the problem of this type of scale out is that First of all, you can have very unbalanced workload in each of the database. Like for, uh, if I'm a user, I'm only gonna log in once, which will use the user database and the account, account, account database, and then I'm gonna do a lot of things in my application, which will overload this transaction database. So basically you have user database, account database not doing a lot of things, and your transaction database may need to scale up, which means you have to spend more money on that. And another way to do scaling is to distribute our data into multiple data, into databases uh, by, uh, by, the data, by the content of the data. So for example, I can uh, shard or I can partition my database by the last letter of my user's last na uh, first name. And put the first name with the last letter A to F in the first database, G to M in the second database, and go on. So in this case, I will need a router between my application and my database. And the good thing about this is that because I'm putting the account information, transaction information, and the user information into the same database, so first of, first of all, it, it, it is much easier for me to balance the load among all the databases. 
And the second of all, because they are in the same, the information for the same user are in the same database, sometimes you can optimize the query performance. And so there are two ways to deal with this router. You can either write your own routers. Uh, trust me, it's not a fun thing to do. And another thing to do it is to use MongoDB sharding. So just a show of hand, how many of you have used sharding or running like a sharded class, either in Atlas or on Prime? Thank you. And how many of you who didn't raise your hand are planning to try it out after this MongoDB world? Great. Like we did, so that means we did MongoDB world right. We have you guys learn new things and try out new things here. Uh, so here I'm going to Give you, uh, just give you a quick overview of the, like how sharding work, how the uh, uh, configuration looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go, to go into very, uh, a lot of details because uh, we have other talks, uh, my colleagues are talking about sharding uh, at MongoDB World and all the recordings will be available on Monday. Uh, so when you have uh, doing, sh like doing a sharding for MongoDB, uh, first of all, you, we, you, we will introduce a new process here called Mango S. So the Mango S is acting as this router. It will route your read and write requirement to the right, to the correct shard. And we also have a separate database, uh, MongoDB, their instance called, uh, it's a metadata, metadata database, uh, which we store all the shard, sharding information and all the routing information and other metadata we need for this sharding topology in this database. And for each of the shard, it's an independent MongoD instance a cluster, so you, you could have like you, you could configure like a single instance, you could configure like multiple instances for each of the shard, and the request will be routed from the Mongo S from your data driver to Mongo S, and then to the Mongo D cluster. So the forces we need to consider here is that first of all, again, partitioning and sharding they are not free. They add complexity. You see how complicated it is that uh, topology is compared to a single MongoD configuration. And also, more importantly, also add latency because we, your request is not going directly from your data driver to MongoD and we have Mongo S in between as, a, as another uh, as another uh, hub. So when you consider to use sharding, you need to make sure that this additional latency is acceptable for your application. And also adding shards means that, uh, means that sometimes you have to balance your data. You could have like one shard growing really fast and become really big. Then you want, may want to split it into like multiple shards or you want, may want to like move some data to other, other shards to balance the data. And that is a data movement operation, which means we have to raise some data from some of, of the, uh, the MongoD, which is hot or busy, and move it to another MongoD. So this also can also int uh, introduce additional cost and also use additional resource from your database. And the third thing we need to consider is that if we do sharding, uh, we could have, uh, we call it scat uh, scatter and gather queries, uh, which, which means the, the, the query you are running, the data needed for this query are not in the same shard. So for example, if I have a sharded cluster sharded by, let's say, customer names, and I'm, I want to query all the people who is younger than 30, then I have to go to all my shards to get the data and get back to Mango S and do an accumulation and union it together and then return to the data driver. So for this type of scatter and gather query, it, so the query performance won't scale linearly, which means uh, you, won't, you probably won't get ideal performance for those type of queries. So we do have some best practices. For example, you should always include your shark key into your, in your query to help you to avoid this type of performance issues. So the solutions here are, first of all, uh, we're still talking about scale up. 
Again, I'm not saying you should never scale up, but you should always make an active decision when you're trying to scale horizontally. And the good thing is Atlas make it easier. So you don't have to purchase the hardware. And when you, get, you, when you say I need to scale up in my database, you don't have to get rid of your old hardware, which you know is, you're going to lose a lot, a, lot, a lot of money on that. With Atlas, you can start your database from a smaller instance, even like a free tier. And then when your application and your business is growing, you can feel free to upgrade to a larger instance and to be able to handle a heavier workload. And you could partition it manually, but it adds a lot of complexity and also development cost. And also you need to decide like why you are sharding. Is this because you're, run, you're running like your query performance? Or is, is it because you don't have enough RAM in your current instances? You're trying to uh, scale out your queries. You can have more memories, total, total, total memories for your whole MongoDB deployment. What about backups? Uh, the question is, what about backups? Uh, can you be more specific? Like, um, the rule of thumb for backups, and I'm, I'm speaking more so from so the rule of thumb for backups, and this is more so from the perspective of on-prem deployments, mm -hmm. is that um, after two terabytes of data, and this is raw data, that we should consider sharding. Yeah. Um, that's to, one, make restore times quicker and allow us to back up in yep. a faster manner. Right. So, I mean, um, we talked about scaling out with sharding, but backups wasn't mentioned at all. So has something changed with the backups that we no longer need to consider that for, for scaling out? Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 again, I'm not mentioning all the factors okay. here. I'm just mentioning the key factors, but I talk about backup, the backup restore story. If okay. you have like a very large database, it's not only a poor problem for relational database, it's also a problem for uh, document DB for MongoDB, that if you have a large database, it's going to take a long time to backup, and eventually it's going to take a lot more time to restore, because that's going to be an even more serious problem, because every time when you need to restore a database, something wrong is happening. You're like in like a file drill. You want to be able to restore your database as soon as possible. So yes, that can be, that's also can be a factor that you want to shard your database, uh, so you can take like backups for each of the shard. Yes. In, uh, individually, and when you restore it, you can do the restore in parallel instead of you have to restore the whole database uh, in a single thread. Absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, oh. So when we do the sharding, the query will get slower, or com does it introduce any complexity? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? When you do the sharding, right? Uh huh. So does the query get slower? I think that I have the data, big amount of data, it's sharded in multiple places. So when I query it, does it impact any yeah, performance? So yeah. and also? Sure, your, your mic is off. Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to share. If, if it's a scatter gather query, the query will be as slow as the slowest shard. We have, a, we have a use case. Just I want to go and get the count. I assume that I have the millions of records. I just uh, millions of records are some, some, it's varying from customer to customer. Some customer has a millions of devices, some customer has a 50K, 25K and all. Just I want to get the count saying how many devices are in low battery state, how many are, are in the disconnected state. I want to get the, just the count. So if it is in shorter pace, maybe it will impact my dashboard, right? Because it will take long time and it will be kind of a spinning, spinning at the end. It will come, come up with the count. Is there any better way to get these counts without doing sharding, or I still be able to bear with these performance issues? So, uh, so if I heard a question correctly, is that you have a you have a database, and you have a collection, and you have like multiple documents in the collection, yeah. uh, representing like different type of devices. And you only need to know the count, the number of the devices. So are you going to like add any filter on top of it? Or you just want to know how many documents you have? Just I want to know how many documents with that state. For example, I'm querying for. Uh -huh. yeah, Give so me the uh -huh. count of all the low battery devices. And 
So is uh, again, is that like a question related to sharding? Is, I yeah, so like, when I was mm -hmm. reading through that, when you do the sharding, yeah. normally it will impact the query performance. Uh, it depends on like how do you do the sharding, right? If you do the sh sharding like in the correct way, it can even help you to improve the query performance. So for example, if you say, I, okay, I, usually I need to need know the count for each different type of the, the device, then you, you, you can probably consider the device type of your shard key. Then you have like device type A in one shard, device type TP in one shard, and every time we acquire it, it will go to the same shard. So it will be the same performance, but as I said, the latency will be a bit longer because you have to go to Mango S first and then go to the shard. So one thing is I'll not be able to go and split it because the device that keeps reporting, mm -hmm. I cannot go and take the decision saying, okay, I'm putting these devices into one shard, right? It's kind of just that status is changing. My documents are there, my device documents are there. Just I'm updating the status saying, okay, this device is low battery. That means I'm not doing sharding. There is no dynamic sharding. Um, now, Shif, sure do. So I think you're saying that you've you've got the documents. They're all in different shards, and you want to count. The, you you have a dashboard to keep account of certain types. So you could you could do a materialized view with aggregations to have to be able to do that get that count any time. I think you could use the yeah. new column um, features as well. You, you, you could simply maintain a counter in the database and just update that every time you write one of those types of documents. And that could be in an uncharted collection. So, you know, sometimes once you turn on sharding, you don't have to shard everything as well. So. The counter, counter approach is introducing a lot of errors. If for any reason, if something gets missed, then our entire counting is screwed up. That's why we were talking to the MongoDB account team. They said they, are, they have the, the aggregate count feature recently introduced. I'm not sure, I've not tried it. But uh, they are saying that, that will give the count. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I can check. Yeah. Or, or you could use the aggregate count occasionally to check the error-prone one that you have, you know, so you could run that. So if, if you've been trying that and it's using a lot of resources, you, you could do that periodically and then fix the, the other account that you have that you've been doing manually. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do it, uh, you know, I think to solve that problem, unfortunately. Um, some, sometimes there's too many. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Another question? Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Uh, one personal comment uh, in terms of uh, overhead. The fact that you, you're right about the latency and everything, but uh, the fact that our sharding are smaller, uh, the index are smaller and everything, so it's a very uh, trivial, the, the, right, yeah. the, uh, the overhead that you're going to have. Right. Uh, but uh, regarding the question exactly is uh, uh, on step of when exactly we um, we uh, as a company we uh, we need to uh, to put ourselves uh, in the view to do the sharding uh, would you say that uh, the best thing is to go first uh, scale uh, up uh, the CPUs the the memories and see how it interacts and and at uh, which uh, mm -hmm. threshold you will say okay at this uh, when you'll see that uh, I don't know, the yeah. CPUs always are like 80% or, sure. or load on the server is this and that. Mm -hmm. and then you need to go that direction. Yeah, so the question is like, when do we need to like decide like if we're gonna do sharding for the application or for the company? So there's no golden rule for this. There's no say, okay, when your database grow to one terabyte, you have to do sharding. I think it's, based, it's totally based on your business needs. And so one thing we, uh, we're gonna talk about is that uh, if you believe that sharding is going to be uh, the right solution for your business or for your application in the future, not even today, like for the future, we even recommend you to do to create a database with a single shard. So, which means like in the you don't have to enable when you need to do sharding, you don't have to enable sharding. You can just add more shards into your database. And also, there's uh, like there, there, uh, we're not also not saying that oh you should scale up first and then you go sharding. You can do scale up and scale out at the same time. 
uh, again, it's depend on like if what what is the bottleneck of your application. If your application need more memory and need your CPU, yes, scale up will definitely help. But if your application is like you try you have like a large, very large data set and you're trying to distribute your queries, then sharding will be a better solution than scale up in most of cases. Sorry, what's Auto sharding? Uh, yes. So, uh, in have, have, you, have you guys heard about uh, Atlas Serverless? Serverless. Uh, sir, I saw some, some, some up. Yeah. So in Serverless, we are trying to do like auto sharding, which means like you don't have to worry about sharding. You don't have to worry about like uh, your uh, scale up, scale down your database. Uh, Jer, I'm not sure like what's the, st the current status. Do we have? Yeah. Right. If you are converting from existing replica set to sharding, then how do you factor in the connection count? So I think the connection is also one of the parameter on the database side, right? So yes. if you're running on the replica side, if you have thousand connections. Now, if you go with a three-way shard, so do we need to do something? Some, like how, how do you kind of retrofit or, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is like, how do we con con uh, configure the connection, con config and the, con the connection count when we are using a sharding uh, strategy? So first of all, when you connect to Mango S, uh, the, client, the client driver is also using a connection pool. It's just like when you're connecting to MongoD. And at the, and at the same time, you won't, you won't connect to MongoD directly. So your connection to MongoD will be through, through uh, Mongo S. So in this case, it's, you, you can just treat Mongo S as a MongoD uh, in terms of like counting the number of collection and configure your Mongo connection pool. Yeah, there's, there's, inter, there's, there's pools then between the Mongo S and the MongoDs as well. And you can configure those also. Yeah. So you can set the min pool size and the max pool size and those as well. So you can, you can configure all of that. All right, let's move on and we have eight minutes left. So like one thing I'm trying to point out here is that uh, I'm not saying today go back home, start application and uh, create an M200 Atlas cluster because my business is gonna grow really fast. So programmers would like, like tend to waste a lot of amount of time and resources worrying about like the performance on the nine critical part. And so let's try to get prepared. We need to scale up, we need to scale out. We know how to do it, when to do it. And at the same time, also try to uh, uh, avoid premature optimization. So it's gonna not, uh, not, so not only gonna harm to your application, but also your wallet, right? <laughs> so for the next pattern, we're gonna talk about like how do we select a good shard key when we're doing sharding. So here is an uh, like a sample document here. So I have ID, I have a transaction time, I have a, a username, zip code, country code, age, gender in my document. So when I decide to shard this collection, which field should I choose to use as my shard key? So this is what we're gonna solve in the, the problem we're gonna solve in this uh, pattern. So you need to, so the goal here is to distribute the, the data in the optimized way that you can gain the best query performance. So let's try some other fields here. So for example, I can use the transaction time, which is a data time as a shard key. So the problem of a data time shard key, because it is monotonic. So it's like always growing. Your data will now winding back, back. So in that case, it could introduce inefficient writing because you will always have your last shard, uh, your data write to your last shard and then later we need to rebalance it. We need to balance, take data from your last shard and then write it again to other shards to balance the data. So that will in introduce multiple writes and uh, uh, make your write more, less efficient. Uh, another thing we can do is let's just use ID, a GUID, as a shard key. It's random, it's re really random. So I can very well distribute my data into different shards so there's no concern for my write performance, but at the same, if you will use a GUID, like a super random uh, 
ID here, the problem is it could, it, it could lead to a bad query performance because uh, as we mentioned in the previous pattern, we could have the scatter and gather query, which is like run a query and the query need to reach to all of the shards, gather data, and the Mango is gonna do the aggregation. So uh, let's look at some of the forces. So first of all, uneven distributions will cause performance issues. We already know that. If we have like a really hot shard, which is dealing with, for example, 90% of my request and other shards are not doing anything, that's a not a good situation. And, and also at the same time, we want our shard to be a p sharding uh, topology to be optimized to man as many as queries we're running up uh, uh, applications when it's possible. So there are four principles. Uh, I have to say this is not a golden rule. This is not a silver bullet. So you have to, uh, to consider it based on your business needs and how your database, how your database and your, your collections and your document looks like. So the first of all, you want to choose a shard key with high cardinalities, which means you want a shard key with uh, um, like large numbers of different uh, distinct values. So for example, gender won't be a good shard key because it's very low cardinality. And the second uh, principle here is you want a even distribution. So uh, for example here, uh, de again, depending on what type of application you're creating, let's say you're creating a, a mobile game application. So the age, which maybe like has higher cardinality than gender, but it won't be like even distributed because you probably have more younger people playing the game than older people. And the third principle here is to, you want to use a shard key which is frequently included in your query. So in that case, the Mongo S will be able to redirect this request to, the, to, to a single shard, to a single Mongo D to run the query instead of having the scatter and gather query and have the query running on all the, sh on all the shards. So for example, ID here is a bad example of uh, uh, frequently including query because you probably will never use a random ID included in your query. And the last one is you don't want to use a, a monotonic key uh, field as your shard key. Uh, I mentioned that before, uh, that that will cause this double rights or even triple rights issue. So when you write, you write it, and you will have to, in the backend, we'll have to move data to other, to other shards. So the solution here uh, is first, you can always use a hard, uh, hashed shard key. Uh, it will help you to make the field uh, more randomly distributed, but like a lot of people like harsh shard key, but I would say this is not a silver bullet. When you use harsh shard key, you have to risk, every time when you try to use a harsh shard key, make sure you really think about it, because first of all, it will not increase the cardinality. If you have like, if you use like a Boolean value as a shard key, harsh it will, will not make it like, will not create a third value. It will still be true or false. And, and also, hard shard key will, can also cause some uh, additional performance issues and compared to like non-hashed uh, shard key. And another solution here is that you can consider to use a compound shard key here. So you can have two uh, fields in your shard key. The, what, the first one is like a random-ish, but with lower card cardinality. And the second one can be ascending, uh, we can, uh, to guarantee like uh, efficient writes. So example here is that I can use a compound shard key with zip code as the first field, and the ID as the second field, which is like a very random, but, uh, uh, but doesn't have like the value uh, for my query. And another thing I want to mention here is that uh, another usage for sharding is that you can create a zoomed shard, which means you can put one of your shard in a, if you're running Atlas, let's say, you can put one of your shards in a different region from other shards. So this can be used in some cases, for example, if we have any, any people from Europe still here? Yeah, we still have few uh, European guests here. So you guys must be very familiar with GDPR. So in some of the cases, you, your customer, your client will require to have their data 
to only be hosted in their own country or in a certain region. So in those cases, uh, you can create a shard which is locate, located in a different region from other, uh, other part of your data. And you can, so that will guarantee you have all, uh, use, for example, user ID or like a field in your uh, document which can identify the geolocation as a shard key. So that will guarantee that you have all your user data in that shard in that certain region. So uh, let's look at some problems we could, uh, f could be facing when we're doing sharding. So first of all, like your shards can out of balance. So as in that case, a single node can become a bottleneck. So uh, for example, if you decide to use the transaction time as the shard key, I believe most of our query will go to the last shard, which is the most recent data. And that shard is gonna grow really fast and then we need to rebalance those data. Wait, I think we're missing a slide here. Okay, so here basically we're talking about re we're talking about rebalancing, rebalancing the shards. And so when, when your data uh, when, when your data is like uh, out of balance, you have we have to rebalance balance the shard or say rebalance the shard. So MongoDB allows you to configure your uh, cluster to balance your data. So the solution here is that you can. Uh, Modify, you should modify your balancer window to make sure you do the rebalancing, do the balancing at off hours. So basically, it's when your application is not working uh, on a heavy workload and when nobody is connecting to your database, you can use those time to, do the, to balance your data. And you should configure uh, the chunk size and to make sure that you can get the most efficient configuration there. So smaller chunks will often lead to more even distribution because we, when we move data, we move data by chunks. So when you, if you have a smaller chunk, we can distribute your data even more evenly. Uh, but that also uh, could intru introduce more frequent rebalancing, also more frequent uh, re uh, re migrations of your data. Uh, at the same time, large chunks uh, may lead to few migrations because we are not going to move those chunks very frequently. But at the same time, uh, it, uh, it comes off the expense that you potentially have uneven distributed data because each of the chunk are larger. And the other way to uh, rebalance our data is to change the shard key. So if you are running any version uh, before 5.0, like 6, 4. Point something, and you have to do this manually. So basically, uh, you have to back up your data, drop the whole, uh, whole uh, collection, create a new sh collection with the new shard key you want to use, and then import your old data. So this will introduce significant downtime to your database and also your application. So starting from 5.0, we'll have this uh, new feature called live resharding, which means we can do the resharding in the back, in the back end, uh, in the background, so, and you, uh, without interfering your application logic. So you can still do inserts, updates, and do, run your queries, and we're going to do the resharding uh, as a, as a, as a uh, background process for you. Uh, but I'm not saying this is free. So this also, because resharding will move data, and this will also consume resources, consume connections uh, to your application, it will definitely introduce uh, query, maybe query degradation, performance degradation, including uh, the latency and also the throughput for your queries. So the solution here is that, uh, as I mentioned, if you, if, when you're planning for your application, if you decide, okay, sharding is gonna be the ultimate solution for my application after two, year, after two months or after two years, uh, well, you can add shards before you need them. So you can even create a uh, MongoDB cluster with a single shard, and later you can add more shards to your cluster. So any question before we go to we're running out of time, actually. Let me just finish the pattern 12, which is very simple, very fast. We can do it very fast. So the context here is that you are going to production. Congratulations. And <laughs> so going to production is not easy. And we're not there yet. So, and you have to select, like, tweak the OS, hardware. Uh, we, we were talking about, like, how, like 
how can I know like what hardware do I need to purchase if I'm running MongoDB on, prem, uh, on, on premise with some of the customers? And again, so there are like a lot of forces. Like I want performance, but as a Jerry mentioned, you cannot say, well, people you say that, but you cannot just say, I want it as fast as possible. And, and also there's the fact of cost, because you, uh, in most of the cases, the faster also means more expensive. You need to have a more, like a better hardware, you need to have like scale out, which means you need to have more VMs to run your databases. And also time, it's like how much time you're gonna use spend to build your application and also to maintain your application. So for example, if you only like creating a simple application, you probably don't want to go through the problem to create a sharded cluster, especially when you're running on-premise, because you have to manage the topology by yourself. That's another benefit you get to running in Atlas, because if you're running in Atlas, you don't have to manage the whole shard topology by yourself. You just say, I want to shard my cluster, that's it. And Atlas will config and manage the sharding topology automatically. So the solution here is our, first of all, we have some li uh, links here for production notes, operations checklist. Uh, later you will have the QR code to go to the Twitter thread and have links there so you don't have to write it down. And read those and make sure you follow the best practices before you go to production. And make sure you do load testing before you launch your production and keep doing load testing because the load could increase. Your application could be handling more users, more workloads going forward. And also be realistic. Don't, don't expect there will be magic. There's no magic. Performance is about testing, about tuning, about uh, making sure all the components can work better together and to identify what the bottleneck is. And there's so, and you cannot expect like, uh, I'm zero clusters to handle thousands of, of thousands uh, queries and it also runs smoothly and also give you a good response time. And if you're upgrading or porting from either lower version of MongoDB to later version of MongoDB or from like other type of databases to MongoDB, make sure you read the release notes so you know what new features are, what are feature changes in our new versions. So as here we Almost done. I'll give it back to Jer, and we just do a quick summary, and we'll be answer some questions if you still want to stay in here after the talk. Yeah, yeah, we can we can wait, and uh, we'll we'll be happy to talk. I'm going to very quick. So this was the full list of all of the patterns. We're going to skip the extra one because uh, it wasn't to do with MongoDB. So here's the QR code for a Twitter stream for a link to all of the references. And as Zhao Chen said, you should be getting the slides and a link to the video. Um, please, please say it's working if somebody has scanned it already. Yeah? OK, excellent. Whew. I put that up a couple of weeks ago, so uh, I, I should have checked to make sure it was still working. So all the links are there to, to these resources. Basically, there's a great blog post by Kevin, who works for MongoDB. There's a blog series on performance by Matt and Henrik. Um, there's a really old blog post from Jesse, who's one of the driver engineers. I think Jesse's doing something else mm -hmm. now, actually. So Jesse's moved to a different part of the organization. But so compound indexes. Really One good. quick thing about the blog posts. Those blog posts were created like in 2000, uh, 2020, like two years ago. Uh, if you see anything outdated, uh, need to be updated, let us know. Uh, we're working on maybe a new series of blog posts to make sure that we introduce the new features and also uh, mo even more performance best practices. Jesse's one is actually an old one, though. It's from like 2012, and but it's still actually correct and valid for, for, it's on his personal blog, so. Um, the Donella Meadows I mentioned earlier. Brendan Gregg's book, he works for Netflix, really good on systems, you know, looking at an individual system. Again, they're all in the Twitter series, so I'm just, and uh, um, a deceased member of our team, William Zola, he did a video, I think, at Facebook or Google, um, and a lot of the things he talks about in that YouTube video are still true as well. 
a lot more about sharding than the, the data modeling ones. And there was also a video uh, Shamik did. Shamik was here earlier. So there's a video of his talk on Invincible Workload Management. So you could go back and look at that as well. So these were some of the talks that happened. The, the one that Asia and um, Joanna did, Diagnostics and Debugging in the Cloud. It would be, be well worth watching that video as well when they come out. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, everyone should be applause to ourselves. We made it. We made it to day three. And so we, we'll, we'll stay here and we, we'll chat. If anyone wants to keep talking, we're, we're here. But there is a, an online in the app kind of, you know, it's not my funny QR code anymore. It's, uh, the, it's the official feedback. So please, if you've got feedback, we'd really appreciate it um, in that, that route. You can use my funny QR code as well yeah. if you want.